Good morning. Um, welcome to the Thursday, March 14th Board of Carroll County Commissioners Open Session. And as always, we will start with a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Priority Carol, and I think it's Commissioner Rothstein's turn to start. <clears throat> okay. Um, good morning, Carroll County. Uh, great opportunity to share a few thoughts. Uh, one, I think, Chris, do you have um, those slides? Yeah, so yesterday we were very fortunate to host an activity down in the South Carroll Senior Center where the state and federal VA came in under the PACT Act and provided services for our veterans. The veteran support officers uh, were on hand and we had 75 um, appointments and all of them were full uh, throughout the day. In addition, we had um, other services uh, available sharing their uh, abilities and capabilities that serve our veterans and veteran community um, met with uh, that that last picture I met with a couple folks from the VA federal side and um, very uh, impressive share with them that in my opinion that no one does it better than Carroll County and Carroll Countyans know how to serve our veterans um, to highlight Celine Steckel and Gina Valentine and Bobby and the whole team um, with all those VSOs. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what we do for our veterans and uh, the millions and millions of dollars that have come back into our veterans' pockets, the transportation services. Um, no one in the state does what we do. And, it's, and I, I will continue to say it's not about flagpoles and monuments is about services. Um, and it's a, you know, the, the, those that know the problems are the ones that are living those problems. And we uh, have to have the ability to listen and learn from that and lead together with those solutions. And I think that's what our veterans um, services does so well in Carroll County and Carroll County government. Um, we have really uh, crossed over a bridge of distrust uh, with government. Uh, this is not our, our parents' VA anymore. This is uh, a service that is just second to none. Um, so yeah, and I think there may be one more picture. Just again, yeah, those are some of the tables um, uh, of services. So really, really well done. Uh, very well attended. I will be going back to the state and currently we have 75 hours of uh, veteran support officers uh, time allotted uh, per week and I'm going to go back to the state and say we need 90 or more and uh, uh, work with them to fund more VSOs because people know to come to Carroll County and Carroll County government and citizen services and Bureau of Aging Disabilities and to our veterans services to get the work done. Um, we partner with other nonprofits. That's great uh, because it's one community, one team, one fight, but we do it just so well. So, you know, more to follow as I continue to address it. I just want to highlight that for uh, the community today. So with that, um, I know you and I did something, you, you can highlight that Oh, okay. your um, time. So I will pass the baton over to Commissioner Vigliotti. 
Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. Um, I'll touch on a couple of things that I've done this week. Uh, try to be brief because I know we have a lot ahead of us. Uh, so uh, Monday, I had the uh, awesome opportunity to do an in-depth tour of the Clerk of the Court's office where Clerk of the Court Heather DeWeese brought me around the courthouse to meet all the amazing people uh, who work there to provide necessary daily services to citizens, uh, everything from wills and records to marriage licenses. I know that Heather and every member of uh, the clerk's office are cons constantly looking for ways to improve and enhance the services that they offer, and uh, we're certainly blessed to, to have them. So thank you, Heather, for that wonderful tour. Uh, Monday evening, I had the privilege of attending the uh, uh, Tawny Town City Council meeting for the promotion ceremony of now Sergeant Shane Schultz. Sergeant Schultz is a dedicated and capable officer with the Tawny Town Police Department and I had the honor of working with him when I had previously served on the uh, City Council. So this is a well-earned uh, and well-deserved promotion. Uh, Tuesday morning I had the uh, wonderful chance to meet with School Superintendent Dr. Cindy McCabe and the privilege of receiving uh, the first of more than one tour of Carroll County Public Schools uh, main office. I ran out of time so I get to go back for, a, for another part of the tour. Uh, Dr. McCabe along with everyone who work in that building, these are dedicated, capable professionals who take their roles in education very seriously uh, and their very, uh, county is very well served by uh, these individuals. And so Dr. McCabe, thank you very much for giving a part of your morning to run me around uh, the offices. Uh, Tuesday evening, I attended the monthly Carroll Republican Victory Social Gathering at Johansson's in Westminster uh, where our own Director of Management and Budget, Ted Zaleski, was the guest speaker. As everybody knows, Ted is happy to visit any group or organization to talk about the budget and the budget process. Uh, Ted did an excellent job of speaking and fielding questions and I also hopped in to answer some of the more policy oriented questions that came from those who had attended and so hopefully I did not wreck Ted's evening too much. Uh, Wednesday morning, uh, yesterday morning, I was excited to attend the Farm Museum Advisory Board meeting with Jane Sewell. Jane Sewell, uh, the Farm uh, Museum Advisory Board are wonderful people, uh, and uh, the Farm uh, Museum Advisory Board are wonderful people, uh, and the Farm Museum itself, uh, as you can see in a, uh, Chris, you have the photo that I took from the Farm Museum in the Farm Museum yesterday. Um, there we go. Either they're uh, in the midst of doing all of the uh, work necessary to get ready for the spring and summer seasons, uh, and they are very much excited about the coming months, including the return of oxen and other animals from their winter vacation. Uh, there is an opening on the Farm Museum Advisory Board, so any uh, citizen in the county who's interested in serving, if you have a background in farming and or history, uh, please do submit to be a part of the board. Uh, the Farm Museum Advisory Board also wanted me to extend an invitation to the entire Board of Commissioners. Uh, once the uh, budget season is over, they want to have us out there for a tea. That will include light fare, sandwiches, and obviously tea. Uh, so the invitation will be for us and, and a plus one, and, uh, and maybe we can round up a couple of other people to uh, come from the county over to the, the tea with us sometime this spring. And lastly, in keeping with tradition and currently batting a three for four, I'd like to ask Commissioner Kyler what he thinks of my vintage green and gold block stripe tie today. I, I think it would be most appropriate at a T. <laughs> so it's approved. It's approval. <laughs> I'll remember that for this spring. So uh. I'm four out of five now. My odds, I'm, I'm getting better here. And that's it for me for today. Thank you. Commissioner Gordon, you ready to follow that? I don't know. It's a tough job to follow. <laughs> I don't know if this tie works for that or not, but we'll try. So, good morning, Carroll County. Wanted to. Uh, I'm going to be rather brief this morning for the most part, but wanted to uh, start out by talking about uh, an upcoming event, uh, National Vietnam War Veterans Day, that is being held March 29th at Mission, Bar Mission Barbecue. There will be uh, free sandwiches that will be available for veterans. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the, our veterans in the community that have served to. Uh, to uh, turn out and as always you know we really truly appreciate as Commissioner Rosting said not only the community at large but our nonprofits and our businesses that uh, support and look out for our veterans which is something I think we do very very well in Carroll County um, the other thing I wanted to bring up just briefly this morning uh, last week obviously during session there was some conversation regarding the uh, idea of removing the uh, supermajority regarding raising taxes I heard that conversation and I understand where we all are with this budget. This budget is beyond difficult to say the least. 
On January 29th of 2023, this board unanimously voted to support strengthening the requirements needed to raise taxes. Uh, last week, there was a comment regarding a three, that a 3-2 vote could remove this. Whether we take votes to purchase services or products, whether it's for grants, whether it's a moratorium, or whether it's the upcoming discussion and vote we will have on, rec on recreational cannabis, uh, we take votes. Our votes are legally binding, and if we don't hold ourselves accountable by our votes, then why can we accept the public to do just as well? Uh, the document on the screen here is a copy of that resolution we passed on July, or excuse me, January 19th of 2023, in which the last paragraph reads, now therefore it is hereby resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Carroll County, Maryland shall not repeal the taxpayer protection set forth in resolution 815-2011 unless such is approved by at least four of the five commissioners. This resolution takes effective immediate upon its execution. I do truly believe that this board has the opportunity to work together and resolve this budget. I think it is something that we as a team collectively can come up with. And I think it is something that we need to work together in a long, hard look as a team. I do not, and I know some of my colleagues have agreed and stated this as well, feel that we need to be raising taxes. I'm also going to mention a quick quote this morning. Former Associate Justice of our Supreme Court of the United States, Scalia, said it best, quote, words have meanings and their meanings don't change. This resolution, according to this document, requires four in writing, not a simple majority. And I want to point that out, as I know it was mentioned in the paper incorrectly, that it was noted as a 3-2. And clearly, this document states otherwise. And I yield back the rest of my time this morning for Priority Carol. Thank you. Commissioner Garen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Carroll County. Uh, so it is called Priority Carroll, and as, as just referenced, there's um, Commissioner Gordon mentioned mentioned the budget, um, and uh, I want to discuss that a little bit this morning as well because uh, I've I've mentioned some budget numbers in the past few weeks, and uh, they've been met with some skepticism and some questions. So I don't know, Chris, if you could throw up um, some numbers that I've received from the budget office. I think we all received these a couple weeks ago. But what, why, why am I putting them up here? Because I want to make sure that people, th these numbers are important. Now, I understand that there's a lot behind these numbers. There are general fund transfers. There's, these include salary increases. Um, these include uh, efforts to create an EMS force. But when you look, these numbers are directly from the budget uh, office. And they clearly show that revenues have increased but spending has far outweighed the revenue increases. What's a revenue increase? In this context, it is taxes. It is taxes out of people's pockets. And I will post these numbers on my own social media sites so people can take a look at them because I think they really are what should guide us over the next couple months. And there is nothing more important than what we're doing with the budget over the next couple months. Uh, now, the debate in some cases, it's a fervent debate over taxes is not new. They are raging all over this country, uh, this county perhaps, the state for sure, and even in our own federal government with Congress. These aren't discussions that are new to anybody. Um, when I'm told I do not understand how budget works, I, I try to be polite, but don't tell me what I don't understand. The American public, everybody understands what's going on with budgets. In fact, our own party and the people that represent our county are in a serious uh, struggle right now at the state level to rein in what's called the everything tax. I'm sure we've all heard of it, where the state that doesn't want, they don't want to raise income taxes, but they're going to raise the tax on everything else. And the chairwoman of the Republican Party and um, her supporters are our delegation, and our delegation's been doing a great job of this. I know Senator reedy has been on the airwaves um, trying to explain to people how bad this is. This is a quote from her. She goes, because the governor and the Democratic leadership and the General Assembly refuse to make cuts and spend within their means, they are planning to instead force taxpayers to make cuts in their own personal budgets to pay for the state's reckless spending. That works for the Maryland State GOP. It works for people who are trying to argue for a better budget in Congress. I don't understand why that wouldn't work for our county as well. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because those numbers that you see on the screen, you can take them down, Chris, those numbers we see on the screen are very important. They mean something. 
numbers mean something as well, not just words. And that's what our focus should be for the next couple of months. I certainly hope it is. Um, I, was, I was disappointed that the debate last week turned to just changing the majority to a non-majority somehow. I'm not really sure how that would work because that was discussing the issue of taxes and revenue, which is taking, people, taking money out of people's pockets. And that's not something we should do lightly. I would rather us see look at priorities and spending, which is being echoed all over this country and this state, before we even consider doing something like that. And I, I haven't heard that to date, but I'm hoping that's part of our debate over the next couple months. Um, it'll be a long debate. Uh, I'm sure we'll have differences of opinion, but we're gonna spend a lot of time on it as well. So that is all I have for Priority Carol. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. And before I get into mine, I'd like to address the last two things were said. Number one, 87 million over five years probably did not keep up with inflation. So just so we understand, uh, um, we're not keeping up with inflation. It sounds like a big number, but when you start doing the math, I, I, I forget, um, and I didn't have time to do the math now, it's about 3.5% per year. Um, and of course, it included COVID. Um, the four to one vote, I am very, very glad we discussed it last meeting. We need to discuss more of that stuff. We're getting emails now um, on the four to one vote, on cannabis, on the budget, and on many other things. I'm, I'm glad we are. I, I think we need to be open. Um, I don't quite understand the four to one importance. I kind of think it's a joke, but um, that's my personal opinion. And uh, I think any commissioner here needs to bring up anything they want us to discuss anytime. Um, and, and I don't regret um, any time spent sitting here in open with the county watch and discussion, any of it. And like I say, I do appreciate then getting the emails and I think a couple of the uh, various political clubs have voted whether to endorse or not endorse, you know, what we did. And, and I, I think that's great. The, unfortunately, the cannabis is probably more of a passionate issue right now than the budget. And, and that's a shame because uh, the budget's probably the most important thing we do. And the cannabis, of course, we're somewhat tied by federal law, state laws, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I, I, feel, I feel very good, um, Commissioner Gordon, like you said, we're gonna figure out the budget. Absolutely. It ain't easy. Um, but, um, you know, that's, uh, I don't think any of us, uh, decided we wanted this job thinking it would be easy. <laughs> and, uh, and I love the diverse opinions. I, I just, I wanted to mention, I just had budget canvas before one vote as about a 10 second comment this morning, but, uh, um, I'm glad you guys brought it up and I'm glad, uh, that, that people that, that, that Commissioner Rothstein brought it up last meeting to, to talk about it. And like I said, we, we need to do that. We need to do it in public. Now back to, uh, not that that wasn't why I love Carroll County, but now back to why I love Carroll County. Had the transit advisory meeting this week and a cabinet meeting and uh, we got great staff and uh, um, I learned something every meeting I go to. Went to the Ag Center meeting the other night. They talked about um, their upcoming gun raffle and some other activities are going on at the Ag Center. Um, we have veteran celebration meeting later today and uh, Maryland Municipal League dinner tonight. And uh, it's all great stuff. It all, it all takes, takes time. These meetings take time, but it's all, uh, like I say, it's what we bought into. And uh, I'm blessed to be setting up here with four gentlemen that uh, take that job seriously and do it well. And like, like you said, we're gonna figure it out. And uh, probably have some ugly conversations during the process, <laughs> but, but you know, that's what we need to do. Now, um, I did get to attend the Drug and Violence Awareness Expert at, at Ex Expo at the <laughs> Ag Center. Um, the other day, and, and it was a great event, and Commissioner Rothstein was there. Um, 
Carroll County teen was there, and uh, we we posed for a picture with one of the canine dogs, and then Tim Weber made sure I knew Lem Satterfield was there. Um, Lem is is in recovery and speaks passionately about it, and it's great, but like all people in recovery who have had um, their challenges with alcohol or drugs or whatever. Um, Lem was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun back in the 80s and 90s, probably covered Carroll County better than the Carroll County Times did. There were a lot of mornings where I'd tell people at Dutch Corner, if you want to see what happened in high school wrestling last night, grab the Baltimore Sun because the Carroll County Times um, didn't notice it went on. Um, so Lem did that. He's now has uh, reports on some websites, on social media, and uh, and he can't go too many places without talking about his recovery. Now, uh, I think uh, staff here is going to straighten me out. Lem did that selfie. I cannot do selfies. I, I do selfies, and uh, I don't know why. When I hold the camera, I would look about 30 pounds heavier and less happy. He he holds it, and it turns out semi okay. So, yeah, that was a great event. We walked around, talked to a lot of people. People complained it was a little chilly there and too quiet. At nine o'clock. Nine thirty. Yeah. Nine thirty. The eighth graders hit the place. It was no longer cool. It was no <laughs> longer quiet. They were just buzzing around, talking to everybody. I introduced a few of them to, to Lem and Tim. And uh, it, it's just an awesome event. And it was great to see the eighth graders there. Um, and I know, uh, I'm not sure they were excited when they heard that the, one of their class trips this year was here. I think they'd rather go to DC or Baltimore Zoo or whatever. But when they showed up, they were thrilled they were here. It was it was awesome to see them running around doing it. And uh, and the sheriff was there and one of the canine dogs and uh, um, it just, it was a great morning. I had to get back here for cabinet, but uh, it, it's just, it's amazing what all happens positive in Carroll County. Um, anybody else, anything? Very well said. Okay, legislative update. <clears throat> Good morning, Mike. How are you today? Good morning. Good morning. morning. Well, got some bad news before uh -oh. I got in here. So. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, legislative, not personal. No, everything's good there. Good morning. Um, yeah, so this is the big week. Uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of bills on the floor, so the floor sessions are going until 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they'll start, if they can't get through everything, they'll, they'll start coming back in the afternoon. Um, they may be there on Saturday, so a lot happens really quickly now. Um, so to, to kick it off, our, our bills, um, the only one I'm concerned about is the one withholding the permits for unpaid taxes, uh, but uh, contracts and the, the contract threshold bill is passed both houses, so that, that'll go. I don't have any issues, uh, any concerns about the, the public facilities bond. And the sheriffs? And the sheriffs, yeah. I don't, well, as I understand, there's some internal there is issues in the delegation that may complicate that. Uh, I believe that has been taken care of resolved. Okay. and resolved and gone to the Senate. But um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I say often Carroll County, nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans. I feel that there's some Carroll Countyans that just refuse to represent Carroll County in the best interests, but and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, some personalities and, are coming into And it's a play. shame for me. Everybody in Annapolis, I think, tries to accommodate local preference mm -hmm. bills. And when you have someone 
from your own locality that's raising issues that um, yeah. that don't look correct to anybody, it, it muddies the water. But I think I think because it is a local bill, and I think because yeah. they honor it, I think it hopefully it will go through. But it's just a shame, and yeah. and uh, and we supported it. Which I issue is something. The issue is unrelated to the bill, too. Yeah, so right. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's more of an embarrassment than anything. And, um, yeah, it's it's sad, I mean, that we have to go through pole vaulting over these little mouse turds that should not exist. But uh, when you have somebody that's vindictive, mean-spirited, and other things, so be it. But that's where we are. So the big issue, of course, is the budget. Um, that was debated on the floor, uh, on the Senate floor. So the big issues I think we're concerned about, obviously, community colleges and, and highway user revenues. So the they did restore, I can't give you numbers, but the description is that they restored some of the community college money in the Senate version. Um, and as far as the HUR goes, they basically reduced it back to the amount that it would have been going forward after fiscal year 28. So when we got those increases two sessions ago, they, they increased up to 26, remained at that rate, I think 4.3, 4.7, excuse me, through 27. And then 28, they were going to go back down to 3.7 going forward. Well, they just m made it 3.7 for the next fiscal year going forward. For 25 going forward. Right. <clears throat> right. Um, so they will pass it. Um, it'll go to the House. Then the House gets their crack at it. Now, that takes us right into the issues in the House around taxes. Um, so, you you may have seen some of the uh, some of the news reports where now the Ways and Means Committee is talking about cobbling together a tax package. Um, so, what does that mean? That means probably um, a large part of House Bill 1515, which was the one that would reduce the sales tax from six percent to five percent, and then tax services. Um, at 5% going forward. So their calculations say their net increase is um, $3 billion on this, uh, I think, in fiscal 27, 26 or 27, uh, because this would go into effect January 1st. So they'd be collecting from January 1st. Um, it's interesting when you, I've, I've also, giving you a hyperlink hyperlink <laughs> to um, to the fiscal note so you can see some of the numbers that they're proposing and um, it's interesting because the the three business related categories collect more than the balance of the categories added together so as you said initially this is a small business killer quite frankly is a real hit on businesses because the business to business services are the overwhelming majority. Um, of course, the other two bills, the cigarette tax and the alcohol tax bills, they very well, well may become part of the package. Um, but they've, they've gone on record. Now, the Senate is firm in saying we're not interested in raising any taxes. So this is going to be one that's going to come down to the wire because April. First, uh, the budget has to be complete and sent to the governor. So keep your eyes open um, and your ears open because it's going to be Has the governor fight. spoken on this? Um, He's going to ask. He has, n not that I've heard or read, um, he, you, you know, his initial stance was no taxes. Um, I don't think he's come off of that. Um, my, my sources are telling me that uh, Chair Gazzoni in the Senate is very comfortable with where he is right now. He believes that they're in good shape. 
uh, for this year and next year, and that there's time to look at these these revenue requirements because it's going to happen. We so, know that. Yes. Yeah, so not to increase this. The at Senate the, wants at this to, time. Yeah, and yes. and the governor would be expected also to adhere to that as well. So he would, would have to not, go back on all the statements that he made earlier. Right. So therefore, understanding you know the the, the newspapers and this everything tax thing and people mm -hmm. you know yapping about it, but right now it's in the Senate's hands, and the Senate. Because I, I think I read the same stuff, is that they're looking to not support it, and then it would not be supported by the governor. I, so that that's good news, and I think that's what we're pushing for, right? I mean, that, right, yeah. right, okay. yeah. I mean, this 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 came in late. First of all, this bill was heard late. Exactly. This session. Um, you know, so much of this is is politics and positioning, right? And. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the Ways and Means Committee is the Revenue Committee, so, you know, it's their opinion. Now, I will say that, that Delegate Moon, who is the uh, majority leader, um, brought this bill in, and he, he did make a good point in saying that, you know, we all took these votes on blueprint, and everybody was willing to take those votes, but, you know, there was no discussion of how we were going to pay for it, and that was a mistake. And he's absolutely right. So, I mean, the the chickens have to come home to roost at some point. Goes back to Commissioner Kyler saying that Dr. Kerwin could be very well in education, but regarding fiscally, there. Hope he has a good financial plan. Well, <laughs> yes, but but this is smoke and mirrors. A, they're yeah. reducing sales tax, and no, they're increasing it. But for Blueprint. 98 million is a joke. That's, that's out of 24 jurisdictions, that's right. 4 million each. The bigger jurisdictions will get the bulk of that. We, we might end up with a million dollars. And it, it's, it's not funding blueprint. Right. It's, it's, they're, they're doing a token amount of money to, to the schools and trying to make it sound like that's their justification. It, so it, hopefully it'll die in the Senate and we'll move on. Yeah, so next yeah. Year. I mean, again, right. Is it is it fair that everybody pays more sales taxes and Carroll County Public Schools might get a million dollars? You know, it's right. it's ridiculous. Yeah, as far as the political calendar goes, too. I mean, this is a year you typically see that. Right. The, the first year is a honeymoon. The second year is when you do all the bad stuff and hope in two years everybody forgets it. Voters forget. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't know. This is an interesting one. It doesn't fit the mold <laughs> of how these things usually go. Um, so the economic development bill that we had talked about uh, that was going to be problematic for our, possibly problematic for our IDA is not going to move. We, we know that now, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. And hopefully they'll come back next year and put it in the, in the way it was originally intended, which would be a benefit. Uh, one of our favorites, the Freedom to Read Act. So this has been amended. Um, it was passed yesterday in the uh, Senate, I believe. So it was amended to explicitly remove schools, to treat schools differently, so remove them from that fiscal penalty. Um, it allows the board to develop their policies uh, consistent with the state standards. Um, the one change is the books have to remain in circulation while they're being reviewed. So you cannot pull them out, review them, and then move from there. Is that one both House and Senate? Yeah, I think they're going to adopt both of those. Yeah, yeah. both of those will adopt. Um, and also it's now an emergency bill, which means it will be in effect as soon as it's enacted. Um, has to be by three fifths majority, Again, that, which that's the Democrats a good news have. story. This is good news. It's taking the libraries out of the. the well, bill. except for books must, books must remain in circulation until right. reviewed. Yeah, but in circulation. A, that's stupid. But, B, but, that's totally directed at Carroll County. Yeah. When you, when you make a rule, just trying to punish one county, you're probably doing something wrong. But in circulation, 
could mean just yeah, to have them well, I, I used that, the, yeah, I used that word just to say that the books can't be pulled off the shelves. Right. In, in the library. That, that seems totally um, counterproductive to the, the point of what's trying to be accomplished. And I, I, why is it an emergency bill now except to particularly punish us? Oh, because we already have a policy that's, that's, that's in place. Reason. Right. right. I, I just, I, I, I'm honestly staggered by that because if there's something that is, has been controversial enough to warrant a review, then it shouldn't be floating around in circulation. It shouldn't be available until that review is concluded. I'll tell you, it's a... It may be a small victory in the bill, but the overall victory is that it separates the school libraries from the intent of this bill. Oh no! And that's only fiscal punishment. That's but, but it but amends. I mean, the bill was written couldn't have fiscally punished schools no, because but it was poorly worded. All they did was correct their wording. That's true. They didn't, they didn't do anything That's nice. true. Well, it took That's the true. school's libraries out of the discussion, didn't it? They only took well, it out of being punished <clears throat> financially. Right. It was, it, they couldn't it's, do to it's now with. explicit because that was yeah. a question everybody was raising is, right. hey, is, you know, is this, well, okay. and then you read the bill, you say, well, how can that be? Because they're not beholden to the library board agency or whatever. Um, so this now is just explicit that they're not, they don't fall under that. They're funded by the Board of Education. Right. Not by the library agency. Yeah. And so then they just made that clear. Books in circulation, you're saying they have to be on the shelves or they well, could the, be so, available? So when a book is identified as problematic, if it's pulled off the shelf, it has a 15 day has to be reviewed within a 15 day okay. period. Okay. That's, that's, I didn't explicitly lay that. Yeah, out, I mean, it, it's, it, it is definitely targeted, but I think we, we seem have, to come up in every conversation. Have a solution. They don't name us, but it's clear they're talking about Oh, absolutely. About us. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the emergency part of it is really what also gets me. I mean, what, what is the rush? I mean, what, what, what is the emergency itself that, that qualifies this to, to be this kind of a bill? I mean, it just did. Yeah, so my, I. My, in my opinion, the public libraries throughout the state want to control our school libraries, and that's bull. And that, that's the whole reason for this bill. This, I, I'll be honest, this gives me a whole different look at our public libraries and how they should be funded and what we should do for them. They want to be vindictive. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, not what, that's not what we fund them for. Yeah, the bill, the bill stinks, in my opinion. Um, but this emergency bill issue, so how many, how many emergency bills does this, the General Assembly pass every year? A, a couple at most. So is there an emergency, I mean, uh, you see where I'm going with this. Yeah. Is there an emergency bill to address crime? No. Is there an emergency bill to address dozens of schools in Baltimore City that get zero um, test scores? Is there an emergency bill for that? Is there an emergency bill to address like fentanyl and overdoses? Nope. <laughs> Everybody who's watching will see where I'm going with this. Yeah, but yeah. this is the emergency bill. This, this is emergency. their priority. Wow. Yeah. This is their priority. Talk about priorities. Yet, yet you can't do anything ideologically, right? Yeah. This is a total so, idea. Anyway, I think I made my point. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I think Good Commissioner point. Vigliotti Good led point. me into that one, so I appreciate it. And a point very well made to Commissioner Guerin. Thank you. Mike, if I could real quick, mm -hmm. you, since you're talking about education, I did want to ask you, and I didn't have the opportunity yet, um, when you get a chance, if you could look into House Bill 1400, which was an anti-bullying bill uh, Delegate Tomlinson brought up uh, and filed, um, primarily the concern is with, with the way a variety of things have occurred with bullying is that kids that are being bullied or sometimes there's no way for them to protect themselves that is the sort of the thought pros process behind that and uh, it's a bi it's a bipartisan piece of legislation that was uh, brought forward by a, a nonprofit group called be a ray of sunshine foundation uh, in honor of their daughter who passed I was uh, last year so just want to try to see if we get some additional information because I know all of us here up here at times are hearing about various things and concerns about you know the students in our community obviously you know the board of ed runs the educational side in our county i just wanted to see if we could get some additional information on that bill and how that's faring it sounds familiar that maybe he discussed this a little bit 
in one of the times we were down there that this kind of protects a child from retaliating under right. certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll give you some more details on that. I appreciate it. Uh, we talked about Senator Reedy's bill to try to address the issues around the number of halfway houses in Westminster. He withdrew that bill. I haven't had a chance to ask him why, but I suspect as soon as he filed it, he got a lot of pressure. It's going nowhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, but grateful yeah. to him for having tried. Yes. Very yes. grateful to him I, for having tried. He's he's trying everything he can. Yes. Um, I think it's just no way around those federal laws. To take a concern problem. that we had. Not yet. So maybe you should lobby Congress, right? Uh, so the the cannabis restrictions. So the Senate amendments. I think we talked about that. They they were the ones that would increase the distance between dispensaries to 2,000 feet um, and increase the distance from the pre-existing churches and rec centers and such to 1,000 feet. The House amendments, he agreed to the distance between dispensaries, but he left the distance from those sensitive sites at 500 feet, um, added that ability to protest a nuisance um, during the license renewal. That was a separate bill. He added that into his bill in the in the House. Um, but he defined we, unduly burden was one that we talked about in the, the original bill last year. And he tries to somewhat define it in in this bill by saying um, it. Unduly burden includes imposing a zoning requirement or restriction on the use of a property by a licensee that is more restrictive than the requirements established under section blah blah of this title, which is alcohol, right? So he's he's added that in, um, and also that you can't adopt an ordinance that is more restrictive than zoning requirements for uh, for licensed dispensaries that are more restrictive than zoning requirements for a retail dealer, and that you may not adopt an ordinance that establishes a zoning requirement for a licensed grower cultivating cannabis exclusively outdoors in an area zoned only for agricultural use that is more restrictive than any requirements that existed in 23 governing a hemp farm. So that was the one we talked about. If you had regulations on a hemp farm, you couldn't be more restrictive than that. So you don't have those regulations. Um, so this one, it's going to be interesting to see how these two versions, Senate and, and House, uh, come together. But um, the House has not moved, excuse me, the Senate has not moved their version out of committee. So it could be just one of these situations where they're waiting for the other bill to come over, and then they'll weigh in on that and maybe go to conference. We'll see. Um, a couple of bills that I think we might have mentioned early in the session um, that had some effect on us. One was uh, homeless shelter licensing that established a standard for shelters, and it was very onerous uh, for the county and some of the nonprofits. Um, it was cross filed, so neither of the bills have moved yet. It's getting late, late now, so um, that's probably a good sign, but. We won't celebrate yet. Um, the guardianship <coughs> bill, which would expedite proceedings to establish guardianship for a disabled person. The, the intent on this um, was to address the overcrowding in the emergency rooms. And this would allow, um, would, would it drive this process to be completed in 10 days. The judiciary, Maryland judiciary, wrote in opposition to this and said it would be unconstitutional because you'd be violating due process for these individuals. So that means that's unlikely to move as well. Um, and then there's one about mental health emergency evaluation. Um, it would have required you to establish an assisted outpatient uh, treatment program. Uh, the House version amended it to authorize the county to establish this program, and if you don't, um, that the uh, Department of Health, the, the state, would have to establish the program. So the Senate version is still in committee. It hasn't moved. We'll see where that one goes. 
Um, gave you some additional reading. When we, the tax discussion is discussed in there. Um, and then one interesting thing that happened was, um, you will remember the, talking about um, the fa uh, Fair Share for Maryland Act, which was the one that was the really big tax bill earlier um, that was presented in the Senate. Uh, let's see, what, what did that bill do? It was, um, it was a, I think it was going after businesses. Yes. Heavily, it, right? It Talk was, um, what's the reporting, combined reporting, right? And it would actually expand it to worldwide combined reporting, which no state has. Very expensive, very expensive bill. Um, so the, uh, let's see, it was Montgomery's County Executive, the Anne Arundel County Executive, I'm not sure if Howard was there. I don't want to say that specifically, but I know those two were there. So they went down with some advocacy, advocacy groups and had a press conference that they wanted this bill to move through because there were all kinds of tax loopholes for corporations. But uh, County Executive Elrich from Montgomery took it a step further and said, well, we know that the, your donors, talking to the Senate, your, your donors and your supporters, um, you are beholden to them and they're pulling the strings and they're really behind this. Well, Senator, uh, <laughs> President Ferguson really took exception to that and really slapped back and, you know, you guys want to come in here and ask for things, you know, maybe <laughs> you shouldn't uh, denigrate, uh, you know, the body like that. So he was pretty angry about that. So I thought that was a pretty dumb move. I don't think that was scripted. Um, but it just came out, so that tells you about where where they stand on these things. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing, which I didn't mention because I just saw that when I came in this morning, um, and that is um, House Bill 1407, which we discussed earlier, which would prohibit you from uh, prohibiting through zoning any tier one renewable generation, which would be solar, wind, biomass, anything that's in, in tier one. So it's, it's a lot of renewables. And that bill would say you have no authority to, uh, uh, through zoning to prohibit that in your county. Also, you would, this would create a, a um, a situation where the, the PSC would study the electricity demand in each county. They would put together a report that would determine the amount of energy generation a county would need to provide to match the load demand in your county. Um, report that by October 1st of next year to the Public Service Commission. Then the Public Service Commission would have each county conduct a study on how much tier one renewable source generating capacity the county could provide to satisfy its responsibilities as identified in the report. And then by October of 2026, you have to report your findings to the PSC, and then when the PSC gets your report, it has to provide a renewable energy compliance and oversight plan, which ensures that each county meets its tier one requirements within 10 years, establish a timeline for each county to meet those milestones, achieve the milestones to meet that target and then require you to report to the PSC on the status after five years on your 10-year plan. And then <coughs> lastly, each county has to create a 10-year tier one renewable source generation plan in accordance with the guidelines. This bill actually passed the Economic Matters Committee yesterday. And I don't know how because this is the most insane thing I've ever heard. That, that is a complete disaster. And I'll tell you, if the state wants us to do that, then they should have uh, something similar to the health department and social services and board of elections 
and establish a footprint in every jurisdiction that belongs to the state. Because right now, they want to micromanage every jurisdiction through that bill. And we don't have the resources to do it. Um, I'm sure there'll be a fiscal note tied to it somewhere. Yeah, the f there's a fiscal note, uh, and I'll shoot this all to you, and the fiscal note talks about it, but it says you can't really calculate it. You know, Mako came in and said it could be up to a million dollars in each jurisdiction. So part of the bill is, you know, the state can, can provide technical assistance to help you do this. You know. But it's the whole concept. It takes just, our authority. Right. It means you could build a utility scale solar development anywhere in the county. Exactly. Anywhere. What's the name of the bill again? Um, HB 1407. 1407. And um, you could put you wind send, turbines up anywhere. Can you send us your, your briefing on that? And mm -hmm. are there, is, is there a chance this is actually going to pass the, the General Assembly? I can't imagine. There is a okay. meeting I'm about to, a call I'm about to jump on at 10 uh, where Mako's going to talk about a strategy. But Maybe this is just the chair making a point. Um, there's no cross file. But this is, this is a bill that completely wipes out autonomy yep. on a really serious issue. Right. So, so gentlemen, I understand that I know where MAKO stands on this, but I think it's probably uh, important for us as a board to come up with a letter for our delegates and our senators reinforcing that we oppose this. I cannot imagine. Uh, so, Delegate Rose is on economic matters. I, I listened to the vote. I, I actually, the, the hearing in the committee was about a minute and a half. They described the bill very narrowly, and they took the vote. And I couldn't hear the individuals, but I'm sure it was a party line because there's no way the the Republican representatives who are from rural counties. Right. Oh, and I'm, I would I, have I, voted for this. And I apologize. I'm not trying to make the, the, the insinuation that maybe they did. Just from my oh, no. perspective, I want to have something to them, I don't know, to, for added weight or emphasis to the arguments that they'll make against it. Is, yeah. that, is everybody okay with that, that we compose I, some kind of letter or something? That's it's not a bad idea, but if somebody wants to just reach out to Delegate Rose and ask her if there's anything we can do, if that would be helpful, sure. Um, I'm not opposed to Yeah, there's, I, there's out of committee. Right. I'm sorry. You said it's out of committee. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's done. So it'll go so to the. It's going to be on the floor tomorrow. Right. So so the House her, floor tomorrow. her role is done, mm -hmm. except for talking with the other, you know, her colleagues. But it's it's already right. out of committee. Now it goes to the floor. Um, I would, I would, so, right. yeah, this is a horrible. It's just what you described. It just sounds like a horrible bill um, that oversteps all you know, responsibilities that we have. I mean, Breaks a lot of norms. Oh, my A gosh. lot of norms. Well, well, I'm, I, after, after open session, I'm more than happy to, to get in touch with Delegate Rose to let her know where we stand on this. But I, I still feel like we should have something more formal than, than just a, a communication saying, hey, this is where we stand. I'm sure she knows where we stand. And I, and I want to go on record as saying I know Delegate Rose isn't done. Right. <laughs> oh, no. No. Well, th so this goes on to the floor tomorrow. Be second reader. That's where all the floor amendments will get proposed. So this is going to be a long, a long discussion. Hopefully it'll just the die there. Tomorrow. Um, yeah. I, Who's the fact that it passed committee, I'm not going to make any predictions. Who, uh, who, who, whose bill is this? The chair, C.T. Wilson, uh, Charles County. From Charles County. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's the cannabis guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. He is, he is the strength uh, the push behind the cannabis uh, yes. legislation as well he's yes. been very active this session yeah I uh, I'm shocked at this and, and I think about this from my previous life what a challenge yeah. this would be um, so many so many things come into this the market yep. comes into it. Uh, it, it it just it seems I don't know. Yeah. My, some, if you're asking me my opinion, it's a statement. Um, I can't see it as anything else. Um, may, maybe just to drive the urgency that the state has put these goals in place 
and they're not moving right. as quickly as they need to to meet these that's goals. That's what it sounds like to me. Is and, and, and so that's the concern it. is that it, if we strengthen the PSC to overstep our jurisdiction, which it already can, in something more like that, it's, it's just ugly. Um, so maybe it is just a you know shot over the bow saying, hey, we're not meeting the goals across the state, and if we don't meet the goals, we're gonna shove it down your throat. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a bad, bad situation, so. Yeah, that's why, you know, yeah. I talked earlier that the, the, the win for us is so if we can get some kind of state standards to take into yeah. consideration the, the variations across the counties in, you know, at least geography, right. if nothing else, right? right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll report back to you what I hear on this call about what the overall strategy is, yeah. but I'm happy to draft something um, and put it before you. Um, it'll just be, we'll have to determine who we should be sending it to. Um, it sort of depends on what Where happens on the House tomorrow. floor. Yeah. Then it would have to go to the, to the Senate. So yeah. if it's gonna cross, it has to cross by Monday. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for putting your head through a wall down there in Annapolis for us, too. It is. Head to the wall is right. Very hard and often. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank and you. and uh, no offense, but legislation made me think that I skipped something in priority. Carol, today is Pi Day. <laughs> and uh, I know there's some birthdays in the building um, for Pi Day. and. I love Pi Day because uh, it's an irrational number and somehow being irrational, I identify with, so. Um, item two, discussion of nonprofit program target community. Good, Good morning, morning, gentlemen. Good morning. How are you today? Good. Happy Thursday, I think it's Thursday? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. I am here to be very brief. Um, as you know, my name is Matt Ramsey. I'm from Target Community. Really just here to say thank you. Um, we appreciate the 2% increase this year. I'm not here to ask for any more money or do any of those things, but um, we appreciate your continued support. Some of the initiatives that Target's worked on when I introduced myself last year, building strong community partnerships. Um, we've started two endowments at Carroll Community College to support our staff um, as we see the needs of the population we serve through aging become more demanding. We've got a program that our staff can um, go through the CNA program at the community college to gain some nursing skills that translate to better services in our residential community. Um, we also know that with our population, sometimes challenging behaviors, understanding the reasons for those behaviors, and so we've also um, created an endowment so that our staff can do the RBT program at the community college. Those are the big two things that I talked about last year that I wanted to touch base on. Um, we had a significant um, wage increase this summer. Um, our starting salary is now $22 an hour. And so just focusing on workforce development, creating opportunities for citizens in Carroll County to, to develop their skills and their, their livable wage. Those are the two things I wanted to talk about. Again, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for everything that you do. Commissioners? I would just echo Commissioner Vigliotti's comments and say thank you very much. Yep. So appreciate it. Okay. All right. Give you some time back. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Have a great day. Yep. Next item is uh, the arc of Carroll County. I'm not sure Don could be so short-winded, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Might take up the time that he just Thank gave you. you <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Go do a polar bear plunge or something. <laughs> Well, 
Well, good morning, commissioners. It's always a pleasure to come and, and talk about the art, Carroll County, and I just um, want to share a couple of things with you that we're uh, engaged with at the ARC. Um, so the, the big thing that's driving our work these days is our, our strategic plan. We've um, been operating with a plan since 1991, and this one in particular is, is really important. When we started developing it, we were just coming out of the pandemic. We lost about a quarter of our workforce um, as a result of the pandemic. These are staff that just, they, they just never came back. Um, and so as we started to talk to individuals and families, of course, what they were sharing with us is we want to come back. You know, we want to come back into services. So we, we really needed to develop something that was meaningful in terms of a plan to, uh, to be an attractive employer and really build back our workforce. So um, we looked at wages and benefits and, and made substantial increases um, in those areas. But then we, we looked um, internally within the organization and, and looked at, you know, just some of the trends that we were seeing of, of people wanting to be out in the community more and, and how best to support that. So, you know, buying vehicles and, and investing in technology, we, um, I think, bought 90 or 100 iPads so that our staff members could uh, be, you know, more mobile but then still get their work done. Um, and then the other thing that we did is we invested in a national certification program for our direct support professionals. So, you know, each of the, the staff, they have to, to do the classes on their own time. But when they do that, at the end of a certain number of classes that they take, they can get a designation. And this designation is, is recognized nationally. And, and what we found is a lot of our staff were really looking to, to find some ways to grow their career, and so it was really attractive. And we added some, some bonus money um, to them and some wage increases to support that. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to say that, you know, today we've got 51 staff that are involved, 42 are certified. But the, the real number that I want to share is that 90% of the people that are in that program um, have, have stayed with the organization. So our retention rate, if we can get people moved into that program, is incredibly high in an industry that has incredible turnover. And our folks really, that we support, really benefit from that. Um, the other thing that we looked at was, was our, our homes, our residential homes, several needed renovations. And, um, and, and then two, uh, as you know, um, needed to be replaced. And again, I just, I wanna thank you uh, for those lots that will help us to, to build those two um, fully accessible homes. And, and where that is today is where um, uh, we've gotten some of the land work done and it's winding its way through, I don't know, offices here <laughs> uh, to, get the, uh, to get the approval to become um, building lots. Um, the other thing I just wanted to share too is we um, have in, embarked on an employment initiative. A lot of our individuals, you know, want to go out and work, and we think that's a, a good opportunity because, you know, locally, Carroll County, a lot of the business community are looking for good employees, and we think some of our folks would be great employees. And so we're, we're partnering um, with the Institute of Community Inclusion, which is a program out of um, the University of Massachusetts to, to work with them to really enhance some of the things that we're doing, but we, we feel like we have some room to grow and actually do some things maybe um, a little better. Um, in the packet that I gave you, um, we have our annual report, um, and then for some light reading, uh, later on is our program evaluation management report. We are, we are pretty data driven and so you'll see a lot of data about all of our program areas that, that we collect. 
Um, I will note too in our annual report there's a really nice article um, we partnered with the the sheriff's department through a grant that we got and um, so what we wanted to do was really grow the relationship between people with disabilities and law enforcement and first responders you know we, we found over the years that the the more that we can strengthen those relationships you know in the event that you know that something happens you know, hopefully there's a, a, a good relationship there and that, you know, some of the things that we've heard about or read about over the years, you know, won't happen here locally. Um, the other thing that we um, are committed to is, is quality. And so in a couple of weeks, we have a, an accreditation team coming to our organization. Um, to measure our compliance with probably about a thousand standards that really represent the best practice in our industry and that's something that we've been doing for a long time and um, organization is called CARF and we've really benefited from both the insights around our business practices but then also our program practices as well so these are experts in the field that come and, and provide some some uh, evaluation to us and some recommendations or suggestions about how we can continually improve our services. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to lift up too is just in our, our partnerships uh, that we're grateful for here in Carroll County. This is a great county, as you know, to do business in. And so the, the Arts Council, the library's makerspace, um, through some of our education programs, we're partnering with Carroll Community, the hospital, and McDaniel. And, you know, these are all wonderful places for our folks to go and either learn or participate in some kind of a work readiness program. And so it's, it's really nice that we've got willing partners here in Carroll County and, and that collaboration that, uh, that we enjoy. Um, and then just lastly, I, I want to uh, highlight some of our upcoming programs. We've got a Sprouts Film Festival, which is the a partnership between um, our good friends over at, at Target and, uh, and Matt, who was just here, uh, the Arts Council. And it's, it's a showcase of films about people with disabilities by people with disabilities. So that's a collection of some short uh, films that really, you know, convey um, in some ways uh, humorous, some ways kind of um, uh, more serious, um, you know, situations that people with disabilities find themselves in. And so we're, we're really proud. We did that last year for the first time, and this year we're hoping to see that hopefully grow. Um, our annual dinner and community awards is May 7th uh, at Flood Zone, and that's an opportunity for us to really recognize not only people in this community, but a lot of the people that we support that have just done some, some pretty amazing things. Um, and we can pause and, and say thank you, but then also uh, lift up some of the, the work that we um, are doing. Um, and then just finally, I, I just I want to thank all of you, you know, for the support not only of the ARC, but, you know, a lot of the programs that, that you all support, like, like CTS and, and access to the grants office and the senior inclusion program and, and citizen services, you know, those, those are all things that really impact our services and help us provide those services much much better so i just i wanted you to know that that, that we do connect um, with with several county uh, funded programs just to enhance the services for our folks and it, it's it's really important that that we are able to do that so again I, I i know maybe not a lot of people know that that that's kind of some behind the scenes but it's it's really important um to, to what we do each day so thank you and those are my uh those are my comments well don thank you for everything that you do you and your organization thank you oh. anything else Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a good day. <coughs> Next up, Flying Colors of Success. You don't mind if I bring my coffee with me? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. 
That is one colorful tie, too. <laughs> it's that time of year. Got to look good. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. I'm Mike Hardesty from Flying Colors of Success. I did have a PowerPoint, um, and I know it's already loaded up in here. I sent this over in advance, and I'm just going to kind of cruise through it for the sake of time. Everybody's busy. Um, you all have uh, either met me in person. Some of you have been out to visit. Some of you are hopefully going to come out to visit. Um, we're the smallest of the Carroll County Developmental Disabilities Agencies. We've been in business since uh, 1991. We were originally uh, founded through a partnership between the state and the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, generally speaking, the individual citizens that we serve have some more specialized behavioral needs and may need more one-to-one -one staff support, which we provide in the community. Um, this is one of our individuals, Rocky. He's uh, got a one-to-one -one staff person, and he's out, and he's engaged in the community. And uh, one of his favorite things is going to the different uh, creamery places and getting ice cream. So. Uh, we like to get folks out and connected in the local communities. Uh, right now, we have a 4.1 million budget. Uh, we're looking at about uh, 4.5 in the coming year. Uh, we're expecting a, about a 3% increase from the state. At least they've told us that's what it's going to be. Um, so we're happy to get that. Um, happy for the money that we get from the county commissioners. Uh, we're expecting to get 56,000 plus this coming year. Just to let you all know, uh, we use the county dollars for unfunded mandates. Uh, state government is always putting requirements on us. And what's an example of an unfunded mandate? Um, let's say one of the individuals we support in a group home goes to the hospital and they're ready to get discharged. We have to have a nurse evaluate them uh, before they can get discharged back to the group home. And then we may have to have interim nursing visits to support that individual and the staff. Well, that's not funded by the state, so we can use county dollars to help fill the gaps and pay for some of those kinds of things. We also use county dollars for some of the trainings for our direct support professionals so that we are assured that they're providing the best quality services to the folks in the group homes. Uh, our homes are throughout the Carroll County community. The home um, featured in this picture uh, was one of the first fully accessible universal design homes built in Carroll County around uh, about 25 years ago. We got a grant from the state um, and the commissioners at the time and our local delegation to Annapolis supported that. Um, that house, the blueprints have been shared uh, with uh, Target uh, community programs. Matt's already gone, but his predecessor, um, I gave him the plans and they've built the blueprint several times. Don, if you guys want to borrow plans or take a look at them, we're happy to share. But it's a, it's a good home, and we've duplicated it. Um, if any of the commissioners want to come out and take a look, it's just what they call universal design. There's no electronic gadgets and gizmos in the home. Everything is designed with a wheelchair user in mind uh, to be passively handicap accessible. Um, we also provide a small amount of day hab and community development services. Um, we've had families uh, contact us with sons and daughters who don't want to be involved in more traditional type programs. So we will connect them with a one-to-one -one staff person and we will work with them out in the community, um, going to the YMCA, taking dance lessons, uh, volunteering at uh, some of the uh, uh, food pantries and things like that. So they're engaged. They set their own schedule, and our staff work with them to have them live their best lives and give back to their communities. Uh, we've been uh, working over the years improving handicap accessibility. This is one of our homes that's up near Tawnytown. 
kind of off of uh, Tyrone Road, we're seeing an increased need for physical accessibility features. <laughs> um, I know Don already talked to you about the need for accessible housing. We're seeing the folks that we're serving age and they may need a cane, they may need a walker. So we're finding ways to make adaptations to our existing homes, um, but we're also gonna be looking in the future to build some more accessible housing. Um, here's one of our guys just having fun making tie-dye shirts. Uh, uh, I, I don't want anybody to think that when you move into a group, group home, you sit around and watch TV all the time. Um, our staff do engage the individuals and uh, create new experiences for them. Sometimes they don't want to participate, they just want to watch, but sometimes we find something that they were never exposed to and they have a great time. Um, the gentleman in this picture, um, that's Ben, and he gave me permission to talk about him. Commissioners have asked in the past, what happens if your agencies uh, ARC, uh, Penmar, Flying Colors, Target. What happens if we don't support you? What happens to those individuals? Well, Ben's story, uh, Ben lived up in the Hampstead, Manchester area, and he was living with family, and when they went off to work, he kind of wandered around town. And uh, if he needed to relieve himself, he would go in the neighbor's bushes um, because he didn't know any different. And when he was hungry, he'd go to the convenience store and help himself to something to eat. Um, doesn't have money, skills, food's there, you grab it when you're hungry and you eat it. Well, he would get picked up by the local police department and brought back home and they know that he was different and he didn't need to be in jail. Um, and I got a call from the chief of police that says, Mike, you know, I've heard about you guys, I've got this guy, can I tell you about him? And I said, yeah, we can help. We have a vacancy at one of our homes. So uh, we talked to Ben and his family. He came out for a visit. They fell in love with the home and he moved in with us. Um, he's a happy-go-lucky guy. He's over at the senior center, participating in the senior inclusion program that the county operates and we're there, very thankful for that. But um, he'll talk with you about the old uh, black and white westerns. He loves to watch them on TV. Um, he loves the Baltimore Orioles. If anybody's an Orioles fan, you talk about the 60s and 70s Orioles, um, he'll, he'll talk your ear off for hours. But the point is, he's in a home, um, he's engaged actively with staff, and he's no longer a burden on resources in the community by causing unnecessary police interventions. He goes out, he's on vacation here at the beach. Um, he's doing things, he's not wandering around um, and getting into any kind of trouble. So this is just a small sample of some of the things that we're doing in the disability agencies and this is just one of the flying colors stories. I'm gonna click through some of this stuff. Um, five years ago now, um, the Board of County Commissioners asked about three to five year goals. And we decided certain things we were gonna focus on. And one of the things for a small nonprofit was become, becoming debt free. So in fiscal 21, we paid off the remaining mortgages and we are completely debt free as of right now. Um, in 2022, we sold our last two story split for your home. So all of the homes that we operate now are on one level. Um, we've continued over uh, the past year to uh, do some wheelchair ramping, uh, converting bathrooms uh, from traditional bathrooms into handicap accessible bathrooms. So this has all been a progression to help the folks that we support to age in place. Um, the last thing on the list, uh, we've been working on getting whole house generators for our group homes. Uh, you guys saw Westminster was in the news uh, uh, when we had that straight line derecho, whatever, it took down all the power lines. Well, we had um, five of our group homes that completely lost their power for uh, as many as three days. 
Um, the cool thing was they didn't realize that they had lost their power because the generators were running. Um, the lights flickered, the generators kicked on. So the one thing we're working on right now is our last uh, two of our eight homes uh, we're going to be hopefully getting this summer uh, Generac whole house generators. Um, the thing that is best about this is our <coughs> folks with medical conditions or wheelchair users, um, they don't have to go somewhere if the power's out. They don't have to look for a hotel or a motel. Uh, we have some folks that have special diets and their food has to be pureed. Well, they really don't make a good battery-powered food processor, so uh, we're uh, able to completely uh, be self-sufficient, and that's been a big goal for us. Um, we're not up to $22 on wages, but here's our wages from 2019 to present. Um, come uh, July 1st, the beginning of the fiscal year, we're looking at making a $1 or $2 bump across the board to all of our direct support staff. Um, that continues to be the greatest challenge, is getting people that actually want to go back to work. Um, sometimes I want to go back to that fight for $15. Um, but uh, we're way beyond uh, $15 minimum wage. Uh, we're having right now a hard time getting people in the door to work for $18 to $20 an hour. So um, four years ago, I wouldn't have believed I'd be sitting here saying that, but uh, we're going to be looking, hopefully getting closer to 22 and then maybe eventually in a few years even $25 an hour, and hopefully that will uh, change things for us. Um, Future interests for Flying Colors, we want to develop more handicap accessible homes. If the county has some more land, uh, we'd be happy to talk with you all about it. Um, we have also some undeveloped ground um, uh, adjacent to King Park in Westminster. It's county ground uh, that we own, but it's adjacent to the park. So we're uh, going to explore maybe doing a land swap with the city of Westminster so they can expand King Park and maybe we can get some property elsewhere to build another um, accessible home. But uh, that's the uh, Crip Notes version. Uh, if I can answer any questions anybody has, uh, we're doing good things for citizens that are our most vulnerable citizens here in the county and uh, we want to continue to work closely with our partners like uh, the folks at the Senior Inclusion Program and our partners at Penmar, uh, Target, and ARC. Well, thank you very much for everything that you and Flying Colors do. I appreciate everything. I uh, wanted one to ask you one quick question. There. You mentioned the uh, property adjacent to King Park. Which, which area is it adjacent to? I'm just trying to visualize it. So if you're in King Park and you look at the woods, yep. we own the woods. Okay. So, and then on the other side of the woods, there's a single family brick home. Yes. Um, we acquired, somebody passed away a few years back and we acquired it and then we had the, um, the acreage cut off and so we would have it in two different deeds and uh, it's it's wooded there's some mature trees that two men can't get their hands around back in there and we thought it would be a beautiful addition to the park it's hard to get um, you know ad adjacent to an urban or uh, city area that kind of land so we're hoping that the city is going to uh, work with us to acquire that land and then give us the opportunity to um, get some property where we can build another wheelchair accessible home. But it's, it's beautiful. It's a nice, uh, there's a stream flowing through it. Um, there's uh, white-tailed deer that walk up and stick their tongue out at me because I'm a hunter and they know I can't go <laughs> hunting in there. So uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And actually we're meeting with the city on uh, Monday afternoon coming up uh, to see what their interest is in that. Well, I, ho I, hope there's, I hope there's interest and possibilities for both of you with that. I know the area and I know that, that parcel you're talking about. Yeah, it's so. beautiful being it a is. nice place for walking trails. Yeah. Uh, for uh, water recharge to meet MDE uh, requirements for water and all the aquifer stuff. I mean, it's got a lot of positive attributes. I know the Director of Recreation and Parks would love to have that addition, but anyhow, so anything else, anybody? Thank you for your continued Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Very much. Thank you. Um, next, we have Penmar Human Services. No, I did it.
So the mouse, just you'll click on the bottom there. And so good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Miller, and although I've been a resident of Carroll County my entire life, and I've worked with Penmar for 36 years, this is actually the first time I've had the opportunity to uh, to come before you guys. Well, welcome. I, I do have a brief. PowerPoint, if I could find it here. Let's see, there we go. And um, so we'll start here. So our mission at Penmar um, is, to, is to support courageous living for the men and women that we uh, come in contact with every day. Uh, is it running itself? Yeah, or? Okay. There you go. There, you go. there we go. Um, and and uh, I've, like I said, I've had the privilege of, of doing this uh, at Penmar for, for uh, almost 36 years. I actually started my career in Carroll County opening one of the first Target homes uh, back in 19, oh my gosh, 1985 for three, three young kids. I think it was one of the first children's homes that was opened in the state and that was opened in Carroll County. And um, so each day in our organization, I'll give you just a, a, a little bit of, of quick history. We, we actually formed in 1981, so we're a little bit over 40 years old. Our first, our first grant was to purchase a van so that some families that had just created this grassroots kind of organization could, could take their kids out to recreational activities and have the, uh, the, you know, the ability to do that without everybody driving on their own because we started our organization right on the Maryland-Pennsylvania line in northern Baltimore and southern York County, hence the incredibly creative name Penmar, <laughs> um, of which there are many. Uh, uh, that, that is kind of how the organization started. And so we started very, very small and, uh, and continued to grow historically because of the needs of the people in our geography. Um, I, I started my career at Penmore in 1988, and I was brought there to run the three residential homes that they couldn't staff in 1988. And as we sit here today, we operate 53 homes throughout uh, Carroll County, Baltimore County, York County, because we do also provide services, obviously, in Pennsylvania. Um, a, few, a few just highlights in terms of where we've gone as an organization. In 2010, we were probably one of the first groups to basically stop doing the traditional sheltered workshop type of work. <coughs> we had done that for quite, a, for quite a long time where you would get contracts from uh, businesses. You'd bring, you'd bring resources into a place. All the disabled people would come to a place and they would work there. And you know, it's interesting when we look back, it's like we would never do that today, but when we did it, it was a really good thing. I mean, it was better than what had been done before. And when you figure stuff out and you, you get better, then you do the next better thing. And so we got to the point where we said, you know, if we're going to support people truly in being participants in their community, do we believe that we can do that while at the same time always bringing, bringing people back to one place every day collectively. And so we made a conscious decision as an organization to stop doing that. It was an interesting conversation with our board of directors at the time because while we, we no longer do that, when we did it, we did it really, really well. We had business partners, we had, you know, we had a great story, but when you would talk to the people with disabilities about the work that they were doing, they would tell us different things. Like, yes, I'd rather make, have a paycheck than not have a paycheck, but I'd rather have a paycheck by going and working for somebody else rather than coming in here and doing the same thing day in and day out. So we developed uh, a program which we called Customized Employment in 2010, and we really, are, we, we really are seen as a national leader in this space because, and, and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, but. We have also created a consulting division in our organization where we consult on how to create that type of process in organizations, and we consult all over the country for that. There are certifications for how you help people look for work, how you help people get jobs, and then how you support them in those jobs. And we've been doing that effectively in our organization for quite a while, but now we're also teaching others how to do that as well. Um, Don, and I also want to just say, the guys that were before me are all great guys. Like, I've known them, I've only known Matt for a few years, because he's only been in Carroll County a few years, but Mike and Don, 
they do an incredible job running their organizations. And Don touched on this, something that the ARC is, has started to do. <clears throat> in, in 2016, we actually began at Penmore what we called our Career Ladders Program. And it was, it was kind of what Don was describing. There is a, there is a national partner that we created a partnership where, with called the uh, National Alliance of Direct Support Professionals. They're out of New York. And they created a process whereby team members could go through a credentialing process. So it's DSP, Direct Support Professional 1, 2, and 3. They had a very prescriptive process nationally recognized, and we determined as, or, as an organization that we wanted to head in that direction. Um, we wanted to do it with a partner because we looked at whether we could do it ourselves and we thought there's something kind of weird about credentialing your own team members with your credential. We want something that is going to be nationally recognized. And as part of the vision for that program, we created an endowment with support of, of uh, one family in particular, but several families have come alongside of us with this to where when we talk about the credentialing and people getting you know, different certifications and you want to reward that, there is no way right now through the states to reward that. It's not like if you get a, a team member credential, they're gonna give you more money because they're credentialed. So, so we kind of had to figure that out on our own. And so we created a process whereby we wanted to build an endowment within our foundation that would support those efforts. And as we've been building that endowment over the last six or seven years, much of our fundraising has gone not just to go into the endowment, but has gone to actually pay for those incentives, those bonuses. We have well over 100 team members that are, that are certified. And, and one of the points Don made, which is a great point, and, it, and it's accurate with us too, is our retention rate for those folks is about 92%. Providers like Penmar, Flying Colors, the Arc Target, we have hired so many people over the last 20 years, but we have turned over so many people. And so the way that we keep people in our organization is more than just a money story. Money's important, money matters. You can't do what you love if you can't feed your family. But there's so much more to that in terms of how you're included in work and how you're valued at work and how the, the, the real work in our organization is between that direct support professional and the person they're supporting. That's where the magic happens. It doesn't happen when I go out and tell a story. It happens when that interaction is happening the right way. And that's what we've chosen to invest in. In 2019, that's when uh, our, we, we increased our, what I would say our footprint in Carroll County. Penmore has two homes, uh, one, one uh, group home in, um, in Lineborough and one in Hampstead. We've had those homes for quite a while. But in 2019 is when we did our merger with Change and we increased significantly our footprint. Uh, I walked through that merger meticulously with Mike Shriver, who was the CEO at Change at the time. And Mike Shriver, incidentally, is the director of our consulting division. So he continues to work with us. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep moving because you could probably tell I could talk all day. Our program obviously operates 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Our services are spread throughout Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, we support well over 400 people on an individual basis. One thing that is not in here is that we are the administrator of the Low Intensity Support Services Grant that the Developmental Disabilities uh, Administration has for families that just need a little bit of help. They may need a ramp put on their house or uh, maybe a bathroom isn't accessible and they need some help with that. We administrate all of that for all of the state west of the, the Bay Bridge. So everything from you know, kind of that, that, that corridor out into Western Maryland, that, that, those resources flow through us and we continue to provide that. We touch about 1,300 people each year through that. Um, and this is just a quick slide to show the, some of the breadth of our services. Uh, uh, I, I will also say this, back on the merger with change, the timing of that was really interesting. Because you remember what happened like in 2019, right? <laughs> COVID happened. Um, 
the, the, our, our boards worked really, really collaboratively to figure out if this was the best move for, for changed, whether it would be better for them to just, just go out and hire another executive director or whether this merger would actually leverage more opportunities for the people of Carroll County. Obviously, we decided the latter, but I will say it's probably questionable whether change on their own could have survived the pandemic because the services that they provided were day services and everything was shut down. Um, uh, th that's, a, that's a story for another day, but timing is always, is always interesting, but I think the timing of our merger was really good for, for both entities and for the people of Carroll County. So we provide community living, day learning. We have a lot of folks that are out in uh, uh, working each day in the community as well, but we do have our day learning centers where people can spend part of their day and then take advantage of the community for part of their day. We work with transitioning youth. There's a lot of work that we do with the Carroll County school system in terms of kids as they're gonna be transitioning out um, as they age out of educational services. Self-directed services are a big deal right now in terms of what DDA is funding, and that's where families have more control of that resource. But families can also purchase some of those services through organizations like Penmar, and so we're involved with that as well. Um, we operate two respite homes in, in York County, and just specifically to Carroll County, we have a respite home, it's called the Respite Inn, that has been operated for, for many, many years. But the rules and the regulations from DDA around respite care have changed drastically. And so facility-based respite care, there's very little of it happening anywhere anymore in the state. And, and, and I sort of applaud what they've done. They've pushed those resources to families, to family members, instead of somebody having to go here and stay for two or three days, there's much more creative ways for, those, for that to happen. So, so we take advantage of that as well. I'll just, I'll just in, you know, in closing, we're supporting over 200 residents of Carroll County every day. I also applaud the integration of services through the, you know, through the transportation and just how organizations work really, I think, really, really well together in Carroll County. Um, have a lot of uh, local business partners that are supporting the people that we support in their employment. And we're actually looking to open uh, probably our first residential home in Westminster uh, sometime this, this year. We have, we have families that we support whose sons, daughters are ready to, to, to be supported outside of their home. Families may be <coughs> aging, they may have needs that they can no longer take care of. So we're there for them when they need that. And um, I won't bore you with funding, but within our organization, we're, we're, our, our fiscal budget is just shy of $50 million a year, so we are a little bit larger. There's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle for us. I will say one of those big pieces is our foundation, and uh, we have created our own foundation, and we just completed a, a, a capital campaign last year to raise money for the, um, the endowment for credentialing in our foundation, as well as this transition of services that has transitioned from everything happens in a facility in a place to how do we help people take advantage of what's out there in the community and how do you blend all of that together. So your support helps us to do that. I am very appreciative of the way Carroll County comes alongside of us because not every county does that. And uh, I think we should be proud of what we do here. And uh, the men and women we support uh, are better for it and our teams are stronger for it. So I'll stop talking and ask you guys if you have any questions of me. I say thank you for everything that you and Penmar do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yes. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Um, next up, Access Carol. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for the chance to share. Um, let me pull up my presentation. Okay. All right, well, I have a very um, large presentation, but I'm gonna super summarize it. So forgive me if I go through, go through things relatively quickly, but I'm happy to ask questions. Um, Access Carol is a very unique entity in this community 
And in large part, it's thanks to all of the collaboration that we receive from public and private health partners. Very briefly, we are a nonprofit. Um, we're a unique public and private health partnership. We are fully integrated with medical, dental, and behavioral health care. We target Carroll County residents that are considered low income, at risk, but we today serve anybody on a sliding fee scale uh, because we do provide some services that for-profit or other providers in the community don't have capacity to do, um, such as medication-assisted treatment for detoxification and recovery of opioids and um, other, other alcohol use disorder. We have a no wrong door policy. We make it our business to know everybody else's business. And um, we don't want to re replicate services, but we want to help refer those patients to where they need to go efficiently. And we do a lot of warm handoffs. So we don't just give somebody a card and say, here's some resources, good luck. We actually say, hold on, yeah, pick up the phone, make the contact, and move that person forward. Um, probably the icing on our cake is case management, which I'll show you in a moment. We are hybrid. We work with a lot of volunteers. Um, and I do report that information um, to Celine's department, actually, so that you all have access to that um, on at least a semi-annual basis. But we started out as a free clinic back in 2005. And we've grown today to have a very unique hybrid staff that's comprised of continued <coughs> volunteers, which includes doctors, dentists, nurses, support staff, other professionals. And we have in-kind staff, such as myself, who are gifts from the hospital system to the community to do this work. There's three of us full-time that are um, placed at Access Carroll. And then we have some support from our Carroll County Health Department. That support was really large in the beginning and as their funding sources have changed, um, so has their kind of on-site support. But nonetheless, we are very closely connected to the health department. And we've been open for 19 years this past January. Um, our mission is to champion health and provide that integrated care for people who need it most. We are a safety net. And we believe that everybody should be involved in their care the extent to which they're able. So we might have to do some hand-holding, which is, which is okay today, because we don't want folks to fall through the cracks. This is a chart just showing, or a graph, just kind of showing how we um, are connected with the community's public health department, the private health um, hospital system, the Partnership for Healthier Carroll County, and we work on all those population health goals to make sure that our constituents receive timely, affordable, accessible care. Um, this is just showing where we used to be, right down off of Locust Lane. We were a tiny little office, and then we um, moved across the street in 2012 to the distillery building, which has become a wonderful second home for me and my family. <laughs> um, so I'm not kidding, actually. But anyway, we are open full time. And we have weekend hours. Um, we're always looking to make sure we serve care when people need it most. And we do still offer, we have been offering for more than three years now, walk-in assessments. So anybody can come in any day, except for Sundays. But we do have that phone call. We, can, we have a hotline that we take those calls seven days a week. But folks can come in and get an assessment, and we can connect it to care, usually same day. Um, we do um, have a governing board, which I think is probably one of the best, if not the best, boards in the county, and um, is comprised of local uh, professionals and then also our ex officio seats of the hospital health department and the partnership. Again, just a little bit about our hybrid team. We work with a lot of students, and I want to mention that we're an academic site. We work with the University of Maryland. We've had residents on site for oral surgery. We've got um, fourth year dentists who are gonna be graduating soon and hanging their own shingle, if you will, to get experience. We have nurses, a lot of mid-level providers, and so on. And again, 98%, actually a little higher, 99% of our patients are from Carroll County. And we, we test that by usually asking where they live and where they went to school. And, and we're really um, connected in with our, with our local community as in the center of the, of the county. We do accept Medicaid and Medicare, if you're into the insurance um, part. And of course, we serve a lot of uninsured or underinsured to, to connect them in. I just will mention briefly and that um, we serve those at-risk folks that sometimes present with a lot of other um, resource agency problems and issues. Um, the homeless, we served 677 this past year. 
we serve seven, we serve 74 veterans, and I mention that because it's always a question that's come that comes up. Uh, some veterans just don't want to go down to the VA, and that's okay. So we're there to, to bridge that gap for them. We serve um, individuals in the detention center, and we can serve them in house or out of house. And of course, we make that direct connection. Um, we serve 1,800 um, Latino um, folks who live in our county, um, most of who are working folks, working poor, and um, we want to make sure they're connected to their health services and their children. I'm not going to go through all this. This is just a list for your reference for later of all the integrated care that we provide. I will mention that medical care is inclusive of MAT, which is that medication assisted treatment. And all of our staff are board certified. People have asked that for some reason, but I just want to specify that or clarify that they are. We have an extremely den busy dental office. Uh, I can't say how busy we are. If I could quadruple my space, I would and I could fill it. Right now we have four operatories and it's, it's, it's filled up. We've got thousands of people on a wait list, literally. And we triage those people out by need and acuity. We address fevers, um, acute pain, pregnant people, children first, and then we um, triage folks based on, again, priority, because the, the, the need is overwhelming. We're the only practice in the county who accepts adult Medicaid insurance for dental care. We also have integrated behavioral health services, so that's the outpatient level of individual group family counseling, of course, connecting in with those folks that are receiving detoxification or recovery support on our medical side. Some quick pictures in case you haven't been there, and I really hope that we can all connect sometime at the office. It's just a doctor's office, but we uh, try to keep it very clean, very respectful, um, honoring the people that come in as being valuable and precious people that deserve really good care. Some operational highlights from this past fiscal year. Just so you know, we serve about 10,000 individual people living in the county. We provided just under 16,000 what we call billable or, or legal encounters. And then we provided an additional 8,000 case management services, again, to those at-risk persons. We have peer recovery support on site, and we do a lot of um, community health work. There is a behavioral health grant that the county has given us. And those behavioral health folks, the outcomes have surprised me. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a data hound. I love the data. And every time I look at that data and send it off to the grants department, I'm so, um, I guess, surprised. But just know that there's a lot of on-the-ground work, as our, the folks that preceded me stated, that it's just that one-on-one -on -one connection that matters, and it keeps people healthy. It replicates into family, uh, living, children, and so forth. Care coordination, Trish is the one nurse there. She's also a hospital employee. He's given to the community, and she works with a very high number of extremely at-risk, volatile, vulnerable individuals along with our community health worker who's multilingual. We have got Insight Pharmacy Services, and I'm so excited to share that we actually have licensed pharmacy services so a patient can come and get all of their treatment on site and get all their medications filled. This pharmacy is not like a, like a CVS or a Rite Aid. They, only, they don't do, as I say, Hallmark cards and pantyhose. They only sell meds. And so they specialize pill package. They will do free delivery for all of our residents. They deliver to the shelters. They do medic education. And all of that's free to the consumer. We also have LabCorp on site. So we have a licensed pharmacy and a licensed lab. And they will serve patients Monday through Friday full time. All of the folks that are uninsured get all their labs done for free by the hospital. We collect it and send it, and then they, they process it at no charge. Um, we do have multi-pronged funding that comes from public and private um, uh, donors, stakeholders. We do fundraisers, of course, and we receive support from you all from our county government, um, which I'm very humbly and, and um, very grateful for. There's a lot that could be said about that. This is our website. You can find most basic information on the website. Uh, we do have a patient portal, all their 
medical records and labs and things can be accessed there. All of our handbooks, patient contracts are all listed there. And of course, anything that the community might need to know about working there, volunteering there, and, and so on. And that's it. So like I said, that was quick. But if I can answer any questions, let me know. We're just, again, a unique community health safety net that's serving our own, own community. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you for everything that you do. Yep. Thank you for having me. Thank do you. you. Do you do some fundraisers? We do, what? yes. So uh, we've had the, our signature has been the Big Band Merry Christmas, and we have, we participate like in the Celtic Canter, uh, the community crop walks, things like that, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Springboard Community Services. Is Ashley here? She might be out there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Well, if I want to take opportunity this morning to thank the commissioners for inviting us um, and introduce myself and my um, co-workers can introduce them. I'm Nicole Jackman. I'm the senior director at Springboard Community Services. I'm Jacob Reek. I'm the lead violence intervention program case manager and outreach and engagement coordinator. And I'm Ashley Stahl. I'm the lethality coordinator for Carroll County and a victim advocate for Springboard as well. Nice to meet all of you. Thank you. So I just want to start with just a little bit of history. Um, Springboard, uh, we used to be called Family and Children's Services. We have been in existence for 175 years. This is our 175th year. Um, and we started in 1849, and it really um, started with uh, the basic being the basic needs of those in need and we have been able to evolve as an organization by understanding our communities and those that need help and support and we've kind of just kept that mission of transforming lives that instill power um, resiliency um, and really empower them to make decisions that um, are better for for their life choices and their families uh, we serve Central Maryland, so we have a Carroll County office, which we'll speak about, but we also have offices in Howard, Harford, and Baltimore City. Um, all the offices are very similar, um, but Carroll County obviously um, have some programs that meet the needs of this specific county. Um, really, case management has been a foundational roadblock, um, stepping stone for Springboard Family and Children's Services. Um, it really is where the organization began um, meeting the needs of those that were less fortunate. Um, so Ashley's gonna kind of talk about some of our case management services. Yeah, so thank you guys. Um, so our case management services are free to anyone in the county um, and a victim of any crime. So you have to be a victim of something to get our case management services. Um, we do a lot of DV work, domestic violence work, but we can serve any victim of any crime, um, which is important for everyone to know. So it goes on as long as they need support. There's no cap on when we stop giving you services. As long as you need support from us as case management team, we can give you that support. Um, we provide emotional support, assistance with basic needs. So that can be food, clothing, um, a phone if they don't have a phone, um, and any housing referrals. We work a lot with different places in the county to give those referrals. We can provide transportation for any medical and legal appointments that are around as well, um, and financial assistance. So if someone um, is in a DV situation per se and they're leaving and they need help paying first month's rent on a new place, we can help them with the first month's rent, things like that. So pretty cool for those victims um, so they can get back on their feet. We also, um, kind of transitioning from the case management services, provide that 24-hour, seven-day-a-week domestic violence hotline for the county. So that's done through Springboard. Um, we have staff on site 24 hours a day to answer those phone calls from any victims that may need help. Um, we also have a weekly walk-in support group. So that's every Wednesday and victims can come in and get support. Um, there's a lot of different people that can come through and it's anonymous. So. Anybody can come in, they can just sit there and listen to other people, they can participate. It's kind of just like a welcomed environment for them to um, kind of get some therapeutic help. Um, we also run the Domestic Violence and Family Violence Safe House in Carroll. So that is um, for adult victims and they can bring their children with them um, of 
family violence, and that's a 60 day up to a 60 day placement. So they can come in and get case management services through that as well, and we'll house them for those 60 days. We provide some food for them when they come in too, um, and also those basic needs that we talked about before. So if they don't have a phone when they come in, we can get them a phone and things like that. Um, then we also run, so I'm the lethality coordinator for Carroll County, so the lethality assessment program for Carroll, which looks different for each agency that reports these lethality screens, um, but we have 15 partners that administer this lethality assessment. So it's an 11 question screen that comes from a bigger danger assessment, um, but for Maryland, this is the Maryland model, it's 11 questions, and if you score high danger on that, it's then reported to Springboard. Um, and then I participate in all the follow-up for those. So I can call those victims if they're willing to talk to us and give them services. They come through HSP, they can come through any of the hospital, um, any police department in the county participates, anything like that, um, care healing center. So we have a lot of different partners for that. Um, and after that initial victim contact is made, they can deny those services, but we like to do the soft handoff. So when the agency is calling us, we hope that that victim's with them and we can talk to them on the spot so that they're kind of in the moment of needing that soft handoff with them. Um, we're the comprehensive DB provider for Carroll County. So we do treat all domestic violence as a whole um, and it is critical to address the needs of the offenders just as much as the victims. So we have Jacob here with us today and he can talk about those uh, services for offenders. So our violence intervention program, we offer uh, three fee-for-service programs. It's parenting anger management, anger management, and abuse intervention. Um, when it comes to uh, the abuse intervention program, it's um, overseen by the Maryland Governor's Family <coughs> Violence Council. We're state certified in the state of Maryland. There's a lot of regulations that we have to follow um, when it comes to it. Our referrals usually come from probation, but also other community um, entities. Um, when it comes to our parenting anger management, it's usually DHS, um, DSS, and CPS. But for abuse intervention, it's usually the court systems as well as um, probation. Um, accountability is the foundation for our program. So our clients are with us for 26 weeks, um, six months. So they meet with us once a week. And part of our program is they have to take accountability for their behaviors and their actions. They have homework assignments and they really, really have to talk about the referring incident and everything that they've done in ro romantic relationships. Another key factor is the victim support for our um, violence intervention program, especially AIP. What we do is we do victim contacts monthly. Um, clients cannot be in our program unless they provide that contact information for us. So we have a case manager who is um, specifically doing monthly contacts, checking in with those victims and making sure that they have any resources or anything we can provide for them um, to make sure that they're in a safe environment. Um, and that is one of the biggest things when it comes to the program is having that constant reassurance for that victim and making sure that somebody's with them in every step of the way. Um, and as Ashley talked about earlier, with all the services that we provide for them, um, we always just make sure that they have an advocate to support them. Yeah, so um, I am actually ending up in court a lot these days. Um, I can go to court with any victim of any crime. So I go a lot for protective orders to kind of guide those people through that process. I'm no legal expert, but um, it helps them to kind of feel a little bit more calm when I'm there with them and kind of walk them through that process. So we can go and support them um, and then kind of stay in touch with them through the process too. So if they're going through a final order, they're going for a temporary order, they have charges against them, I'll be there with them through that. And I also go for the DV docket and we work with state's attorney's office for that. Um, so we're connecting with the victims that have some more serious charges. So say an assault charge mm -hmm. um, tacked onto that protective order, I could be um, a contact for that victim as well. Um, and through that, we have some pretty strong partnerships with law enforcement in the, the community, Maryland State Police, um, all the different jurisdictions here in Carroll, they've all kind of reached out to me on a regular basis now to give me some referrals. So if they meet someone on the street and they're going through a domestic violence situation, they maybe decline the lethality screen and maybe kind of that borderline of like, maybe you're high danger, maybe you're not, but we wanna connect you with these services. They'll just give some um, verbal permission to give me that referral and I can reach out to those victims. So a multitude of ways that we're getting um, connections to Carroll victims. 
And one of our biggest partnerships is with the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and the Child Advocacy and Investigation Unit. Um, so Springboard has two staff that are embedded within the CAC unit. Um, we had one, th one of our victim advocate was supposed to be here this morning, but she's at court with a young lady who is reading her witness, um, her victim impact statement as she's going to court <coughs> for um, child abuse. So Child Advocacy Center, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but it is, is run by the Carroll County Sheriff's Office, but is a multidisciplinary approach on how you really address child abuse um, so it does investigate and provide a holistic approach to any child who's been a victim of physical and sexual abuse um, springboard has the privilege of having a full-time victim advocate um, that works closely with every single victim that walks through the doors um, in 2023 um, there was 160 children that walked through the CAC's doors um, we probably served uh, at probably almost double that because when you have one child that walks through not only are you serving that child you're serving their parents you're serving their siblings you're serving anyone who could be a secondary victim to that trauma um, so it is a, a very uh, useful of our t use, useful use of our time to have a victim advocate there full time um, she can go to court as she is this morning um, she provides connections to resources whether that's um, referring them to our behavioral health program or a case management. Um, oftentimes we have a, a lot, an intersect of um, needs. So someone may come through the CAC, but in, in the investigation or the conversations with that family, it could be seen that that mother is a DV victim. So now we have to get our DV case manager involved to help support that family. Or maybe we see that they, you know, the offender who um, molested the 12 year old, the, maybe the father was the primary caregiver um, and provider. Um, so now we have to figure out how are we going to help her pay rent? How are we going to keep her electric bills on? Um, so it's a multitude of services that we get for anybody that comes into the CAC. Um, we also work closely with Department of Social Service and the other MDT partners that are, if they're not necessarily coming in through the CAC's doors, but they need services, um, we have in a, really clear and easy referral process that they can refer anyone to springboard for case management or for behavioral health um, the advocacy also we at the advocacy center we also have a, a part-time therapist and she provides crisis sessions when families come in so after a forensic interview and in order to make sure that child is grounded and present focused and calm because it can be even more traumatizing to come in for those interviews you know that that therapist can meet with that child Meet, meet with the parents. Um, oftentimes, um, we had a parent recently say um, it felt like a bomb went off in her home um, with the disclosure of child abuse by her partner to her child. Um, and that's exactly what it is. It is uh, almost like we are you know, up against a war in some of these homes. And really, we have to triage everyone who comes in. And that therapist and that victim advocate um, that Springboard provides to the CAC is critical in those services at that unit. Um, one of the biggest things that we do see from the CAC is referrals for our behavioral health program. Uh, so we do have an outpatient mental health clinic that we run outside of all the other services. Um, we are CARF accredited. We actually went through our CARF accreditation um, in the fall, I think it was October, November. Um, and we had outstanding reviews. There are 1,600, make sure I have this right. There are 16 sta 1,600 standards. I did say 1,600, I wanna make sure you hear that part. And we only had marks for nine and they were very, not, they were very minor corrections that we had to make. Um, when CARF came through and, and they evaluate all of our programs, just not Carol, they evaluate every single agency that we kind of interact with. Um, and these auditors were in tears about just how impactful our services have been to all of our clients um, and they talked heavily to a lot of carol um, clients that we serve um, as well as safe house clients that we serve and all the staff um, so to have that accreditation go so well bodes that you know springboard is here to meet the client's needs and we do it with high quality um, we really do kind of focus on trauma interventions for the behavioral health side all of our um, programs really take a trauma-informed lens um, but our our, I'd like to say our specialty is really being those uh, that provider to be able to have trauma 
therapy. Um, I know some people, I'm sure some people in this room have gone to a therapist and they're, they're used to the very um, typical talk therapy. Um, and, that's, and that's fine. But when you have individuals, especially children and youth that deal with trauma, there is very specific evidence-based research treatment that is proven to reduce symptoms. Um, and we pride ourselves that on every clinician that comes through our doors as a new hire within the first six months, they are trained in one of those evidence-based treatments. Um, we have the privilege of having one of, I think, only maybe like three in the state um, that is that she is trained in problematic sexualized behavior. Um, and that is for uh, youth seven, children and youth seven to 12. Um, some people, you know, it, it's one of those dark secrets that no one wants to talk about is when you have children um, acting sexually against each other or you have a child who is excess excessively masturbating or watching porn. Um, and some people in the community might turn a, a blind eye to that. We embrace that and say, we can work with that child and figure out what can we do to help build their skill set so they're not having this behavior. They're not deemed offenders. They're not deemed future predators. Um, we take a, a uniform look and saying, how can we influence them with a very evidence-based research and and that therapist herself she went through an 18 month um, program to reach fidelity to do that and like I said she's probably one of I think there's less than five in the state that can deliver that curriculum we also use um, trauma focus cognitive behavioral treatment um, uh, child and family um, traumatic stress tra traumatic stress intervention um, in this upcoming year probably in the next two months we'll be sending a therapist from each of our office for EMDR um, so we really take pride in saying that we want to be able to provide the appropriate treatment for the needs of our clients and over 70 percent of our clients that we get referred to in our behavioral health clinic have a trauma centered or trauma related um, stress that they're coming to see us for um, so that's probably I, I think springboard is is really making their name known for an agency who can help not just train um, other agencies, but really provide that care to the community on how, do, how can the community respond. Um, one of the high points over the last years was uh, the court case, um, Evan Frock from the Westminster High School Volleyball. Um, Springboard was critical in developing a community response in that and getting the FBI, Sakaic unit, Springboard to have a community meeting that night. And we will be showing up at his upcoming trial in April to support the victims um, that can't speak up for themselves in, in, his, in his hearing. We really want to, I just want to give you, I'm not going to inundate you with a, a lot of numbers, um, but for the last six months, uh, we have served um, 3,200 safe house uh, nights. So we've had 32 beds, nights, um, and filled in our safe house. And when Ashley said family violence, that can be elder abuse. Um, that can be an 18-year-old who lives with their parents who now is being abused and seek, needs seek shelter. Um, we've served over 75 children in the last six months just within our shelter. And for our clinical hours, we've um, seen, we've had over 1,500 um, clinical hours between our, with our office alone, just in Carroll County. Um, I do want to not lose sight on the fact of what we do. Um, I don't want to inundate with numbers, but I do want um, Ashley to share a, a victim story with you, just so you can see, because sometimes we can talk and have all these presentations, but we're losing focus of actually what the need is in the community. So I'll read this to you guys. Um, this was a young lady who I was in court with um, a couple times, and she was giving her victim impact statement and actually couldn't go through with doing that due to her emotion. So she asked me, um, she felt comfortable with me reading it. She asked me to read that. So I'm going to read it for you today. Um, it's just a short snippet of what we see every day and how we help these people. Um, so this is what she had me read in court. Ways that his behavior and abuse continue to affect my life. I no longer feel safe anywhere. I went to a bonfire in February. He hid in the woods for an hour watching me. I feel like I can't get away from him. I don't sleep well and have nightmares about him hurting me, hitting me, stabbing me. I can't unsee the picture he sent me of his knives. I frequently have flashbacks of the abuse, the manipulative behavior, the control and gaslighting, which causes me frequent panic attacks. I have a hard time focusing at school and often feel angry, depressed, and don't want to get out of bed. I constantly feel broken, flawed, ugly, foolish, and not worthy of love. I have a difficult time trusting anyone after he lied to me so many times and assaulted me intimately. I am constantly triggered by things associated with him. Places, people, clothing, songs, it is difficult to escape these things living in a small town. I feel embarrassed when outside my house because the neighbors have witnessed our fights, my crying, and him blasting music from his mother's car after our breakup, trying to manipulate me while his mother sat quietly in the passenger seat saying nothing. 
I feel like I can't enjoy my life because he contacts my friends, harasses them, threatens them, and makes posts on social media to upset me. So like I said, just a snippet of um, her feelings, and that was read to the judge right before he was sentenced. Um, so it's very impactful, um, and it was a, an honor to be able to read that on record to the judge. Um, so it just kind of gives a snippet of the impact that we're making every day to these young and old people. One of our goals for this year is to um, reach more individuals who don't have that voice or need support. Um, so what we're working on is having more trainings, um, community trainings for agencies on trauma-informed um, care, as well as outreach events. So what we're focusing on is having at least one outreach event um, every month. And uh, what we're really focusing on right now is on April 24th is National Denim Day. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's to um, raise awareness for uh, victims of sexual assault. So we encourage everybody to wear denim that day. We will be um, in Westminster on the streets wearing denim and just promoting that, as well as we're going to have a, a softball game at um, the sports complex, and it's going to be knocking DV out of the park, and the proceeds that we're going to raise for that is going to go to our uh, safe house shelter for our food bank. And then in October, because it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, we're having our What is Love event, which is in City Park, and we're going to have all kinds of different um, food trucks, vendors, and we're just really trying to promote self-love. It's going to be an interactive community event, um, sending positive messages to the community just to raise awareness for um, the victims. And I see a couple of you, you look like softball players, so we'll be expecting a commissioner's team sometime. <laughs> When's that game again? In September. We'll make sure that you get a direct email. Start lo trying to loosen up now, because it's <laughs> going to take a while. Well, like I said, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak in, in, in front of you. And please, at, no, at any time, you have my contact information. Reach out if you would like to come visit yeah. um, and just kind of see, again, what we do. Um, it's very hard to do a presentation when what we do really um, you know, matters on a, a whole different level of what's written, what the written word says. So um, please feel free to reach out or ask any questions at this time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much, and thank you, you for the work you that you do. Do you all have a uh, relationship with Sarah's House? Uh, we have referred and we get referrals. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it is. I think when you talk about DV and sexual assault, there's a community amongst us for yeah. sure that we do a lot of referrals yeah. with. Yes. Because they get overfilled, and um, yeah, so I'm just curious. Yes. It, and our philosophy, I always get the question if, you know, do you take out a county or what do you do if your shelter fills up? So we've never turned, we've never, we have right. a very specific criteria and we don't turn people away. So we will hotel people and we have safeguards in place if we have to do that. Um, and we will work with out of county residents as well. There's a little bit of a different criteria with that. Um, but we really try not to turn our back on anyone who's right. in need of an imminent shelter. Because years ago, uh, I was on for Mead and, you know, Sarah's House, we sponsor and we have facilities for them. Um, but domestic violence was very, um, I don't want to say very, it, it was there, and plus other things. And it drove me to establish a resiliency program with outreach to the region to include Carroll County, um, because there's military and veterans and contractors and family uh, here that, you know, either work there or you know, and uh, are impacted through domestic violence. Um, I'm going to have a, a group, and you know, Celine's. Well, I see two of them back there. Uh, we're going to go out to uh, Fort Meade to look at the resiliency program, and the intent is for them to take away. You know, my my intent for them is to take away who else needs to know, mm -hmm. and so that would be something. You know, who else needs to know from your from springboard to get integrated into this resiliency program mm -hmm. because um, it's there you know we just can't you know turn our backs to it or put our heads in the sand so right. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely it. agree. I, I do think that the, the county is very privileged in the sense that we have not had many domestic violence fatalities. Right. Um, we've had one in the last we've had one this year, one last year and then one then the three um, mm -hmm. three years ago but compared to the other counties around us, we don't have that many. However, that does not mean it does not exist. It could right. be underreported or just being labeled as something else. It is there. Trust me, it is It is there. Right. So, okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, next up, we'll hear from Workforce Development on a contract award. Hi, 
Hi, Commissioners. Good morning. morning, Commissioners. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Carroll County Workforce Development Office, requests your approval to award contracts to transfer incorporated in the total amount of $109,375. Two contracts will be awarded. The first contract is for a RPA two for $54,687.50 and the second contract for blueprint again $54,687.50 each contract has a three one-year options for renewal pricing is per an Equalis group contract transfer incorporated will provide classroom to careers pathways training workers for well-paying jobs across every industry via the hands-on simulated training that teaches critical skills for in-demand jobs and funding has been approved in the FY24 budget and I'm going to turn it over to Heather Powell to explain the program. Good morning. So um, we have been looking at this company for the past year and um, feel that it's the right time to engage with them. You know, since um, COVID training looks very different the way that people are willing to engage and um, We've also learned that um, people train and learn in very different ways, whether it's, it's visual, it's auditory, it's, it's hands-on, and the hands-on learning is gaining a lot of um, momentum, and this is one way we can do that for young people. We have two contracts. Um, one, we're designating our ARPA II funds to look at um, training this way, and then working in the blueprint, um, our navigators will go into the school system and work with high school juniors and seniors that may not have um, identified their career pathways. So we can make sure that they have a plan when they graduate. Um, each contract comes with five headsets. It's um, virtual reality, uh, hands-on, it's training in in-demand areas, it's healthcare, it's auto mechanics, it's welding, um, hospitality, and so, one of the things that we do when we're working with individuals, we're looking at assessments. So we're looking at their interest and their aptitudes and making sure that those two things align. And I think by giving people hands-on opportunities um, to train in these areas uh, will make for a better outcome for people. I participated in um, Governor's Workforce Development Board yesterday. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, Kirk Murray highlighted this, of course, and the WIOAs and you know, uh, the programs available for, uh, you know, blueprint navigators and, you know, uh, um, you know, our governor says he's very data driven, you know, yes. in response to getting things in place. And this is one of those tools that can get us some of that data. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, there was a lot of enthusiasm at the workforce development board to get these in place. So. I, I think so, and, and you were speaking to the data that comes with it. Um, mm -hmm. There are short um, tests at the end of each session, and people have to have 100% to to pass. So you're really making sure people understand what they're training. It's not it's not a game. It yeah. looks like things that we use for games, but yep. I think that's one of the tools and ways to engage people. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I'll be I'll be very curious to hear how this program's going perhaps maybe next year Certainly. when you come back before us because sometimes they you know sometimes they do real well and sometimes they just don't take off so we something will obviously as a board need to be exactly to. and and hence the one-year renewable contracts yeah. I don't think yeah. we're entering anything long term in case it doesn't oh yeah well, the outcomes we hope thank you for that yeah any more questions or comments Motion to award contracts to Transfer Incorporated in the amount of $109,375 for training clients of the Carroll County Workforce Development Office. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Now, um, Citizen Service is going to request a public hearing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, commissioners. I am joined this morning with Debbie Standiford, our grants manager, um, and we're here today, as you said, to request a public hearing um, to really have an ordinance change, which would um, we're seeking approval to hold a public hearing 
to seek input for the creation of a local ordinance that would establish eligible uses for the Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund. The Maryland Cannabis Reform Act, as you know, uh, legalized adult use cannabis on July 1st of 2023. A percentage of this adult use cannabis tax will be granted to each jurisdiction through this com Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund that this created. Um, and Carroll County has already received their first allocation um, for our quarterly payment in the amount of $84,618. This fund really needs to support, it's identified in the, in the directives, it's intended to support community-based initiatives that benefit low-income communities and also the communities that were disproportionately affected by <clears throat> the enforcement of cannabis laws. Um, the, the state agency that's overseeing the fund has um, conducted a survey. Uh, they pushed this out for community uh, input. They wanted to s solicit information from the public about the best uses for the fund. They had over 12 th or 1,200 individuals respond to this survey uh, that identified um, the following areas of use that would be recommended. Uh, the top three were mental health and harm reduction programs, education and after school programs, housing and unhoused prevention services, um, and then also reentry and reintegration, adult professional development, entrepreneurship and economic development, nonprofit training and management to support BIPOC community leaders, and workforce development and training. Um, as you can note from the briefing paper, we cannot use this funding to support law enforcement initiatives, and we can't use it to supplant um, resources we already have allocated for programs. Um, the this, the governing structure, um, as you can note, um, we must adopt a law which establishes how these funds received will be used. So that is why we are here today to ask to open a public hearing, uh, a public meeting, so that we may have public input on recommendations from the public um, and have discussions with them about the uses of this fund. Debbie, can did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Can I ask, I mean, did, does anywhere into this factor uh, some kind of program about marijuana use prevention or drug use prevention? I mean, is it, does that fall into any of these categories or anywhere that these funds can be used? And I think that's the education, that, that's the second pri top priority, the education and after school programs would, would factor that in. That's a, a big piece of what the health department does now. And Amy, I don't, Amy Jill from the health department is here with us as well. Um, if, if she wanted to speak to any of the programs that we currently offer, but this would be able to expand some of that reach. Okay. It could be a possible use of the funding. Thank you. Motion to direct staff to hold a public hearing seeking input on the proposed uses of community reinvestment and re repair fund in Carroll County. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I, I, would, I would just, uh, I, I mean, it's not a it's, it's it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. So as as we try to guide our priorities, I hope maybe we can narrow them down a little bit and really try to focus on where this money would have the most impact as well. If that makes any sense, I mean, I know it would be it would be uh, equitable to kind of spread it around, but at the same time, we hope that at least I hope that it can have some sort of impact someplace. And if that means putting most of it in all one place. You know, I just think that's probably worth taking a look at. So. And I think we've already had some initial conversations with Debbie and the health department um, kind of talking about the process we would use and the partners we would all pull in together to really have those conversations as well so that we could have the best impact with the money we're receiving. Yeah, yeah. The other challenge is that we don't know how much we will get each quarter because it's based on the sale. So it, that money may ebb and flow depending on what the sales look like. And, and I think along with that, it's it it's been a little bit surprising to me this whole cannabis issue is so divided i mean we're getting emails positively absolutely don't let this come to our county or this is wonderful what's your problem you know it, it's a, it's amazing how divided it is and like like I said this isn't much money but we we need to use it the best way we can absolutely So you did the motion. Yep. Second. You did the second. Oh, so any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Thank commissioners. You. Thank you. Now, uh, Brian Boki with the annual transportation plan. And uh, so you have real pies. Oh, boy, do we. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Public Works celebrated Pie Day, one of my favorite days of the year. Uh, my, I believe for lunch, we have some pizza pies coming, too. So if, if this gets over late, we can have some pizza pie. Then we got some banana cream pie and pie. mini pies to go. You know, you, you name it. You name it. We have it. So uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to say much. I'm going to hand it over to... Um, Stacy to, to go over where our transit system stands. Um, again, you know, just a spoiler alert, we haven't heard too much new from uh, the, the state and federal levels um, with, with funding. So uh, with that. Well, that took about the whole page that I already <laughs> had prepared. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yep, still good morning. Um, so we're talking about the, an the annual transportation grant again. Um, I was here in January and for the um, approval to hold the public hearing. Nobody requested a public hearing, so we did not have one. Um, but now I'm here to get final approval for the budget and to um, approval to submit the application. So a quick overview of the budget again. Um, the 25, FY25 expenses are not drastically increasing over last year, about $30,000. The increase is really just the contractor expenses due to increasing ridership um, and the increase of fuel between prices and usage. We do expect an increase in fare revenue to go with that increase in ridership, but again, unfortunately, we still haven't heard anything additional from MTA <laughs> regarding our funding. So um, for the application, we're gonna stick with flat funded, like, like it's been for the last 10 years. Um, in all of my conversations with the MTA, it's possible that we'll get more money than that, um, but I haven't heard anything that we would receive less. So. I'm pretty confident that it's a safe bet to go with flat funding um, for the for the application. But we won't hear anything from them until they get the state apportionment from FTA so that they can run their allocation method and how they're going to disperse it across the state. Until that happens, I <laughs> no, no additional information from me. Um, I was hoping that would come in before now and before my application is due next Friday, but no luck on that. So we're going to go with flat funding, and based on that, the total amount of county dollars would be just over $1.2 million. That includes a required 305000 in match to those grant funds. If the grant funds change, the match would change, but with um, the amount of overmatch, that shouldn't change the total amount of county dollars going towards it. Um, we do still have about $550,000 left with CARES funding um, going into next year. We expect to have that much going into next year, so that will be used all up um, to keep the county match down as much as we can. Any questions on operating? Yes. Um, do, do you feel like this is better, worse, the same as the last few years? Has this been, is there any pattern to this changing or is it pretty consistent? What changing? The, the budget, the dollars, the, the, the county money are... versus the other money. Well, for the last couple of years, we've had CARES funding. So the only county dollars that we've used for the last four years have been the required match, that 300000 So it absolutely is increasing this year um, because we don't have enough CARES funding to take us through the whole year. Um, but that was planned for um, five years ago when we took our overmatch out. Um, budget did have it planned for FY25 to come back in. Was that your question? Yeah, yeah no, no, that, that covers it. Okay. I, and I wanted everybody to hear that. And okay. this is all um, discretionary, or at what point does it become discretionary on what we need to match for the services provided? What do you mean? If I we mean, the if required we match um, is based on the grant. So whatever, they, whatever the total grant is, our portion of it is required. The overmatch is everything else to cover the rest of the expenses. If so we limit the service. transportation services across the county, mm -hmm. it would change. It would change. And we are looking at, you know, an operational budget that needs to be adjusted. Correct. So, therefore, if an operational budget needs to be adjusted, um, would we, should we consider? the transportation plan changing services to being adjusted we could um i mean the only as far as you know county dollars again that would match would be whatever the total grant 
would be our match would be required but the services could change to lower the additional county dollars towards right it, because yes. right now it's three hundred and five thousand is right. the match but then we have nine hundred thousand operational dollars that we are committing here to the services we currently provide yes the services we currently provide should those services lessen across the county then the nine hundred thousand dollars should lessen correct we could yes there are a lot of different things that we could do with transportation um, we could change hours we could change the service we provide between the um, fixed route or the door-to-door -door services um, we could change the days of the week that we do there's a lot of different options <laughs> um, yeah. and not that this necessarily helps you this very second but as part of our capital grant um, we I, have I didn't the, get the soprano words would you oh, say sorry um, not that this helps you right now okay. at this very this yeah, very moment got it, got it. Um, but our transportation development plan which is part of our capital request um, is required for us this year right and part of that um, is actually looking at our service and how our service could be changed for both of those reasons for budget purposes and for community and all the things that everybody else would like it to be um, so again while it doesn't help with this budget cycle it would be part of that plan for the next five years um, and that study and the surveys and all of that would happen in the next year because everything's a good idea I mean <laughs> yes and we're going to have to stop <clears throat> services somewhere in this county that's a given whether it's going to be these services or some services um, we just have to be open to that mm -hmm. just like we have to be open to everything and like I always said put it on the table take it off and move on but um, when is when is the absolute latest that we can make a decision about this so right now this application is due next Friday next Friday yeah. so next week right now they did tell me um at our quarterly meeting that they might push back the due date and i asked them when they would let me know and they said Meh. so uh, hopefully before it's due <laughs> but um i right now next week so yeah. i'm not go ahead. no i was just going to say so those that use the transportation and those that participate in it i'm sure would be listening to this and saying don't take away our transportation and you know don't like to use the word haters but there's going to be this you know drive to whatever you do don't take this away you know take away the 10 million dollars that the schools are requesting or take away the fire ems but don't take away this transportation um i get it i i do we just have to look at the entire balance i apologize celine yeah. no no you're sure? fine celine steckel director of citizen services and the majority of the riders on our public transportation are our, our, right. our population that we serve through citizen services with our different programs and services. And you, you had all of our DDA nonprofit providers were in here this morning and presented to you. Some of them mentioned how important the services are that CTS is providing. Um, the majority of their ridership, they work with CTS. CTS directly bills the DDA providers and schedules with them for their ridership, for their programs and services. So it's a very important piece of what they do. Um, CTS and our public transportation system serves those riders that don't have any other um, options for rides, whether it's because of their mobility issues, needing a lift, the cost. Um, the Bureau of Aging and Disabilities also provides donation tickets for folks um, and an opportunity every month to also do purchases of half price booklets. Um, if you're somebody who has a disability or is an older adult to ride our CTS public transportation. So that is another added benefit to help those folks that can't afford other transportation options. So um, when you're considering the um, who is riding our transportation services, uh, recently <clears throat> they conducted a study and we had um, of, of the people that responded, 62% use transit multiple days per week. 27% um, of them were 62, 65 or older. This is the people that responded to the survey. And 32% of those folks using that responded use assistive devices or wheelchairs. 69% um, don't have um, access to a car. And 67% that responded didn't have a valid driver's license. So where we are serving folks, and, and uh, in FY23, we had 1,400 unduplicated individuals that were served through transit. 
uh, through our public transportation, um, and these are our most at-risk folks that don't have other options. We talk to folks on a very regular basis about transportation, um, and when we, and also throughout all the different programs and services that we provide, we do a lot of community needs assessments. And in those needs assessments, the number one, number one item in most assessments that is a, is a barrier to success is transportation in our county. Yeah. And I, I just wanna put that out there so you're aware. It's very difficult though because we're rural and how we serve, and I agree with Stacy. I think that looking at how we are doing transportation is definitely, um, there's other options now. Things are, there's new technologies, there's different ways we can do business, and I'm, I'm talking with Stacy and, and CTS, and we really wanna look at some um, other opportunities moving forward. Um, so, and look at what other counties are doing, and can we implement that here? What would it take? How could we, how could we get something like that here going? Um, so. All those things, I just wanted to, to make a plug and kind of support. I think CTS and, and our public transportation services do a great job. Um, but again, we also, I do wanna just remind everyone, I know we did a survey um, and kind of looked at the cost effectiveness years ago on bringing this service in-house, um, and it was really cost prohibitive. Um, right. So that was another option that, that they <clears throat> did. So. And, and I do recall that, and two points one is I am absolutely not saying I want to curtail the transportation program that we have in place I'm not saying we want to do away with it I'm not you know going there at all and I do appreciate the data that you provided um, again being data driven to understanding the needs and the requirements is so important as we're moving forward so that that meant a lot and um, you're absolutely right. Transportation is the number one challenge when it comes to employment and success of our community. So whether it's mass transportation or personal transportation. I just want to throw it out, but I'm definitely, I, I'm asking the questions because I'm asked the tough questions, but I'm not saying do away with this. So uh, I appreciate it. Right, and I, I certainly would like to see what other potential options there are. I mean, I know I've suggested maybe privatizing or partially privatizing in the past, but there, there are other ways that we can approach this. Because I mean, it, 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 and I'm, I'm gonna be as, as uh, you know, straightforward here as possible. I, uh, you know, we, we certainly wanna to help those who are, uh, you know, underserved in our community. But, you know, we're at a point where if we don't have the money to do anything, they're not gonna be helped at all. So th this isn't a question of, of whether, you know, we, we want to continue or not. It's a question of how do we proceed? And, and so I certainly would like to see what other options are because again, no matter how much we want to help, I mean, if we we're, we're 13.1 million dollars in deficit for the current fiscal year starting out, and if you know in future years, especially the money is not going to be there, we're not going to be able to help anybody at all. And so I, you know, I applaud Commissioner Rothstein for bringing this up. I mean, it, it's something that you know, I think we've all discussed at some point or another. You know, we we really do have to be aware of all of the different options that we have going forward, rather than just how we've always done things in the past. So any, any information that, that anybody can share with us, please, please do. Yeah, um, Deb behind you, yeah. Debbie Stanford, Grants Office. Just an option for the board. We have not always accepted awards at the time of application. That was a relatively you know, new um, um, method to come to the board. So we could certainly get your approval to, ex to um, submit the application and come back to you when we're awarded for approval to accept the award, if that you know gives you any more comfort. Comfort, and I will also say this is a federally funded program with many requirements, including if we were going to unwind transit in any way or reduce services, you would have plenty of opportunities because you'll have to hold some public hearings to talk to people about what that would mean to them. So that part of the the discussion would include the public if we unwound services here or change services. Really, there's. So thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Um, one, and we haven't got to the capital budget yet. One of the things about this whole uh, transportation is the bang for the dollar we're getting, except for um, the 900 that popped up this year. But, but on the capital side, we're, we're getting nine or 10 to one. This we would have been in past years until now. My question would be, so we approve this so you can apply for the grant. That obligates us to the match. Yes. 
that doesn't obligate us to the 900, does Correct. it? We, we can make changes later Correct. to minimize the county dollars going in it that aren't considered matches. Correct. Right? Yes, and yeah, and, services could be changed. and and I come to uh, your meetings and and I've seen um, you do ridership surveys. Mm -hmm. You pretty much constantly look at the the various routes and tweak them based on how it's used, different places, and and it it seems like a an efficient program. And and the one thing that would concern me is uh, well on the capital budget. Um, where else do we get over 700,000 for 75? Do we really want to uh, to make that a cut? So um, that's that's my comments. And my big question was the big number we're not really obligating to by the grant application. We're obligating to the matches. Right. For the grant, right? correct. Okay. And th and I think that's what you said is we don't have to say accept. We can say submit and just yeah, take exactly. the word out yes right and correct and then we yeah. could come back to you yeah. with the awards and and the budget um probably usually we get an award letter sometime in june or july depending on okay. how ahead of schedule they are um based if i could go ahead thank you based off that comment i think for me at least i would i'd rather just do the uh, submission at this point but then the other question i just want to ask in general and I know some of this is always evolving and changing, but are, are we looking heavily into the other ride services that are being provided? I know there was, uh, was it Lyft and some of them were doing uh, services for veterans. I realize that's not veterans here. And I know some of those have been modified or they've been um, removed at this point for some things. But I was just curious, are we looking into those? Because uh, you do, you know, you do bring up a very valid point that everyone knows we live in a county that does have uh, challenges when it comes to transportation. So we have, um, not as in-depth as maybe we could, um, but the problem with Lyft and Uber here is that it's so spread out. There's not a ton of it available. Um, I know that there are a couple, I'm, pr I'm pretty confident, don't tell me this, that the hospital uses Uber and Lyft, um, you know, for last minute discharges and things like that. Um, the downside to that is it's just so expensive. So we would still have to subsidize it for them. Um, so we would still be spending county money um, if we were giving out Uber or Lyft vouchers to make it affordable for the people that ride transit. So I'm not sure how much money it would actually save us in the whole scheme of things. Oh, no, I understand that. I was just curious, because I know like the veterans at one point, there wasn't, a, they were doing it with either limited or no charge, and I know they've modified that or, yeah. or, well, or canceled veterans that. is not included oh, in I this Oh, I understand total. that. No, I, no, no, I, I understand. <laughs> just to be clear, but veterans just is a, not included in this budget. Um, just a thought I wanted to kind of throw out as maybe looking at some other options if there are others as well. Right. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about the capital budget? Sure, the capital budget also hasn't changed since you saw it in January. Um, so we are requesting $200,000 in preventative maintenance. That is our normal request every year. We're requesting four replacement buses. We also usually request four. We usually get three. Um, and the 50,000 in transit um, security, what do I have, facility updates. Um, we requested that last year and they did not fund it. So we're requesting it again. And again, that transportation development plan, um, they absolutely will fund that. So there will at least be a minimum of $10,000 um, county, county match there. Um, but as far as the rest of it, if it's all funded, total county dollars would be 75,000. I doubt that it'll all be funded. We usually only get three buses. Um, the last couple of years, they've cut our preventative maintenance, so that's been lower. So maximum would be 75,000 in county, but it will not be that high if I had to place my bet on that. Questions about capital? <clears throat> okay um that's all i have so if we're i'm gonna guess we're gonna change the motion just to um approve the application submission and then when we get that um pre-award letter we would come back to you for grant acceptance motion to approve the grant application submission of the fy um, grant application submission of the fy 25 annual transportation plan second i have a motion and a second any further discussion all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have the uh, 2024 pavement condition survey and analysis. Also a contract award. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Still morning for another 10 minutes, 11 minutes. <laughs> 
The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Engineering, requests your approval to award a contract to Mott McDonald LLC in the amount of $108,240. Mott McDonald LLC is an awarded term contractor, which was competitively bid. This amount is within the adopted budget. So, as, <coughs> excuse me. As part of our department's asset management program, we conduct pavement condition survey of approximately 932 centerline miles of asphalt roadways every two years. The survey identifies critical distresses in our roadways. It's inputted in our Agile Asset Pavement Management software, which is used to develop our annual pavement management program. It's one of the tools that we use to ensure that we have uh, the right treatment at the right time uh, on the right roadways. Our Mount McDonald Company has been performing this pavement condition survey for Carroll County for several years. Are there any questions? How Ball many? Ballpark. Yeah. How much work does this survey? Mm -hmm. All 932 centerline miles. How, dollars. How much dollars worth of construction does oh, this so help us determine? Our pavement management, 17, 18 million dollars a year, um, 16, 17, depending. Some of that includes pipes and other things yes, like that. Yes. But yeah. So I think okay. we were a little over four million dollars in our in our. Uh, R1 contract last. You said it was competitively bid. Um, I mean, how many went after this? The, the term itself was competitively bid. Okay. Um, okay. Because they are a term contractor and they've done the work before, we don't yeah. we don't necessarily have to receive other quotes because they have already been bid okay. out. So. Okay, I understand. Motion to award a contract for the 2024 Pavement Condition Survey and Analysis to Mott McDonald LLC in the amount of $108,240. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, next up, we have the 2025 Consolidated Transportation Plan. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. morning, everybody. I'm here with Mary Lane and Claire Stewart from our Bureau of Comprehensive Planning. We're here to um, discuss with you and hopefully get your approval to submit the um, what's known as the county priority letter for the FY25 Consolidated Transportation Program. Um, we were here before you on February 8th to discuss the um, the proposed contents of that letter. And Mary's gonna run through a presentation. It'll just give you a sense of what the CTP is, highlights of this year's letter, um, and some of our next steps, just uh, generally speaking. Once you all approve the letter, um, Mary will coordinate with Mike Fowler to get the delegation to sign it, and then it needs to be submitted to the Secretary of the Department of Transportation by April 1st. Thank you. Um, this is pretty much a shortened version of what we were here with in February, but we have updated the letter and you've had it for about a week now. Um, very few changes to the letter, um, really just updating and putting in any ideas that you had had. So very quickly for anybody that might be watching, the um, CTP, the Consolidated Transportation Program, is Maryland's six-year six capital budget for transportation projects, and it contains projects and programs across all MDOT departments. So annually, each county submits a letter by April 1st to the Secretary of Transportation, and this includes state highways and roads, town streetscape improvements, county trails, and transit. And again, these are capacity enhancing improvements to the roads, they're not um, maintenance projects. Um, so the five consistently over the past few years, the five capacity enhancing projects have been Maryland 97, Maryland 32, Maryland 26, Maryland 140, and Maryland 27. And these are all listed as the big, the ultimate projects, and then for a number of them, there are breakout projects that are more realistic and more feasible. So the first one, um, as you know, is Maryland 27 from Bachman's Valley Road to uh, Maryland 140. 
the ultimate for this is to widen the roadway from three to five lanes with a full interchange at Meadow Branch Road. I'm going to point out here that we revised the litter slightly. MDOT has asked that we change interchange to intersection to be more realistic. So that seems like a good change. Um, but that was that is not in the letter you have. I have an updated letter with today's date on it as well. Um, so our breakout project in FY23, our number one priority was to request a study, which is now underway, as you know. And um, there will be a public meeting. I don't believe it's been scheduled yet, but in the Westminster area, there will be another in-person public meeting on this. And we expect the results very soon to pro probably next year identify an actual breakout project. Um, the second priority is Maryland 32. This is on page three, if you wanted to follow along in the letter. Maryland 32 from Maryland 26 South to the Carroll County line, consistently one of the top priorities. Um, again, with this, the ultimate is not on the horizon as far as these improvements. So a Pell study was conducted in 2018 to identify um, breakout projects. And currently there is funding um, from IA IIJA funds for the design of geometric improvements between 2nd Street and Main Street. This year's letter, since there's no construction funds anymore, has asked for the reinstatement of some construction funds for that. Um, the third priority on page four is Maryland 26. Again, this was originally to go from four to six lanes. A study has determined that that's not realistic or probably necessary. So breakout projects have been identified and there is not one that is currently funded, but this letter identifies um, a breakout project to convert eastbound Maryland 26, right turn only lane at Georgetown Boulevard. And that was the number one priority of the 2020 quarter study that um, SHA performed. Um, the fourth priority on page four is Maryland 140 corridor improvements from the county line to Kays Mill. Um, Again, a four-lane divided uh, roadway with a full interchange is the dream, but um, what we're talking about now are, is an initial breakout project, Maryland 140 at Maryland 91. Um, as you all know, there, there was an initial proposal that um, a meeting was held. Residents and business owners were not in favor of that. So a new traffic study is being conducted and potential solutions are being evaluated and you, if you haven't already heard about those from MDOT SHA, you will be hearing very soon. <coughs> um, and the last of the capacity enhancing improvements is Maryland 27 corridor from Carroll County line to Lyshear Road. Um, this includes the widening of the roadway to a consistent four lanes, dedicated turn lanes, signalized traffic control, boulevard separation of lanes, and controlled intersections to allow pedestrian crossings. This breakout project that we discussed a little bit last year and is in the letter this year, um, the state and Mount Airy, and we have been working with them to um, identify a crossing at Center Street necessary for a large development that is in process, in development review process. The preference is an underground or a tunnel, and um, we are asking SHA to continue participating and facilitating these discussions to make them a reality. Um, there are two ongoing streetscape project requests. The first one is in Sykesville, Maryland 851. The second one is Maryland 31 in New Windsor. Um, the Maryland 851 has been at the top of this list for many years. Concept has been completed for it, but it's not currently funded for design. Um, it is currently funded for drainage improvements and the county did just complete their sewer, water and sewer upgrades. So um, again, this is an ongoing request. And the second streetscape is New Windsor, um, Main Street, Maryland 31 from Church Street to High Street and High Street from Main Street to Co Drive. Um, as with all streetscapes, this will include improvements to sidewalks, enhancements to bicycle and pedestrian accessibility, as well as roadway improvements. And this does need to be coordinated with the replacement of water lines within the limits of the streetscape by the town and that um, water main improvement project is currently underway. So regarding transit, I won't repeat this. This is just what you talked to with Stacy about. Um, it is um, requesting uh, four, four buses, I'm sorry, 
and preventative maintenance, as well as some transit facility improvements that are security related. And the last project is regarding bicycle and pedestrian trail projects. This year there's only one. This is near completion and will be coming out next year, but we left it in here because it is not finally completed. This is the Westminster Community Trail. We'll be working with Parks and Rec, Rec and Parks over um, the next year to I try to identify one or two additional projects for next year's letter. Um, your additional concerns We've had this in for a couple years and we will continue to try to get a study of Maryland 26 and Johnsville Road regarding safety improvements, as well as at the request of Public Works, Maryland 140 turnaround for the Northern Landfill Safety Enhancements. And last, was added last year, um, the Tawnytown Bypass to reevaluate the need for inclusion in the HNI. Um, again, it's a critical roadway. We have had meetings on the H&I and it does look like they will be putting it in the update to the H&I. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for expanding the, the paragraph about that in the, uh, the letter itself as well. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, this last um, language on page eight is what all of the um, BMC counties that are in the Baltimore region are including, which is just basically talking about regional, regional support for transportation improvements. Mary, are you attending that BRTB now? Yes. Okay. Um, so the next steps, um, hopefully today, your approval of the letter. Um, we will get the signatures of the delegation and then we will transmit it to the secretary by April 1st. Are there any questions or um, changes to the letter that you have in front of you? Uh, sort of a two-part question. Um, so I've been, I've been convinced that the, the highway enhancement for Route 27 doesn't go far enough north. It should go up to Gillis Falls Road and it's not stop at less year. So I guess that would be for something, that would be something for maybe FY26. I don't know how difficult that would be to get in this year. I assume it's not gonna be possible. We're already ready to go on this thing. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll follow up with an email, but that's something I wanna certainly look at for FY26 is that it doesn't go far enough north. And I know there's a lot of other things going on down there at the same time, so it's gonna affect that, anything that happens with the road. And secondly, uh, the, uh, there's an intersection that's particularly problematic. It's Twin Arch and Route 27, but does the enhancements to the highway mean that the intersections also get some you know, TLC and some expansions and things like that? Or do we have to specifically list intersections within a breakout that are part of an enhancement it, do it make any sense? To, does it automatically get taken care of if it's part of enhancement or do, should we be breaking something out if it's particularly problematic? I would have to look at how okay. that program is, how that improvement okay. is described specifically. Okay. Um, but certainly that is something that we can, if you are willing to wait till next year, we can work that out yeah. and, and okay. look at, as well as going up to Maryland 26, off the top of my head, I'm not sure if that's in the highway needs inventory, so that would be the perfect time now that that's being revised to request that um, expansion of that, but I just, I'm not sure. It might already be in the highway needs inventory. And the highway needs inventory is much longer range than this letter. This letter is okay. for the six year improvement program. The highway needs inventory is unconstrained. It's everything we would like to see forever um, of state road improvements in Carroll County. Okay. So that'd be a separate effort and we can definitely look okay. into making sure that that's included in what's called the HNI. Okay. okay. And also I'll look into the twin, twin arch improvements as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll follow up with an email. Um, so okay. perhaps the, the intersection could be, a, a, it, depending on the answer, it could be a breakout project for FY26, yes. but we don't know yet. We'll have to take a look <coughs> at how things run. Sure. Okay, thank okay. you. Appreciate it. Motion to approve the 2025 Consolidated Transportation Plan Priority Letter. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have the Department of Technology Services for an approval to purchase. Not here. 
I'd say move on to the next one. Yeah. yeah. Want to do that one first? Commissioner, I can find out who's on the line real quick. No, yes, no, is, got, it, and what topic? We've got two actions still, unless that's open. Yes. Uh, we have a caller on the line. If you could identify yourself by hitting star six <clears> on mute, we can find out who you are and what item you're calling for. Catherine Adelaide, uh, item nine. I was going to make a general comment, but item nine seemed to uh, need addressing as well on um, taking revenues from pot to fund county projects. Um, but I can go at the end while it's there. <laughs> Wait till the end. We'll call you back during general public comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. It, if we're waiting, um, is everybody here for Board of Elections? Can we go ahead? Why don't we go ahead and do that one and then come back to item 13? Works for me. Doesn't break your heart to get out of here quicker, does it? <laughs> no, sir. It's, it's, you're standing in my way for lunch now. <laughs> All right. The Office of Procurement in the cooperation with the Carroll County um, Board of Elections requests your approval to award a contract to KM Printing LLC for the printing of the 2024 presidential primary and general election specimen ballots. The Office of Procurement solicited bids for the printing of the specimen ballots and received three bids with KM Printing LLC being the lowest responsive responsible bidder. The results of the bid op opening are listed below. This amount is approved within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be required. So as you all are probably aware, we are uh, mandated by election law to send a specimen ballot. I like to say sample ballot. It's um, to every registered voter who has not already requested a mail-in ballot. This uh, gives pertinent information about early voting, election day, uh, times of voting, the dates, and it actually shows a sample ballot uh, that the voter will expect to see when they go to vote in person. And and this is mandated. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I think there's policy. there's confusion. I got a call and an email when whatever the last mailing was went out, you know, why did we waste postage on that and blah, 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 and I said, well, you know, it's mandated. Yes. We, we don't. You don't mail a whole lot of things that aren't mandated. That's correct. <laughs> that is right. Any other questions, comments? Motion to award the contract to KM Printing LLC in the amount of $46,520.26 for the printing of the 2024 presidential primary <coughs> and general election specimen ballots. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, how long have you been Carroll County um, in your job? Uh, so I came to Carroll County in the fall of 2020 for the general election in 2020. Right. Um, but I was um, hired for the director when uh, Mrs. Berry left back in September. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, can we do item 13? I'm, for, I'm happy to. It's, I'm happy to Bring it on. Sure. Ms. Hawkins can handle it. Hold or yeah, we you can decide what you'd like to do from there. Thank you, Val. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Public Safety, requests your <laughs> approval to purchase. There it is. Keep going. The National Institute of Standards Cybersecurity Framework Assessment and Cybersecurity Penetration Testing from Skyline Technology Solutions in the amount of $29,520. Skyline Technology Solutions was awarded a contract to provide CCPM project management and network operations management service. This project will be funded by the FFY 2021 Urban Area Security Initiative Grant. Good morning, Commissioners. Sorry about that. So I stepped no out worries. of my office for no one worries. minute. Next thing I know, you're on the next item. Um, what this is all about is last year in state legislature, um, several bills were passed where the state has um, taken a role, leadership role in cybersecurity within the state um, and making sure that all of the counties and municipalities are following the same guidelines. 
Um, they set up some reporting requirements that we have to do each year to let them know where we are status-wise. And as part of that, um, we also have to have it verified by an outside company. So what's happening is, is that um, to complete the requirements for this year, I worked with uh, Ms. Hawkins and she got us a grant to be able to fund this. This is going to become a budgeted item. This is something that's good for us to do whether, regardless of whether or not the state would require it. Pen testing, just so that you understand, is we give an outside vendor a little bit of information about our network and they see if they can find holes that allows people to get into our systems and then let us know if they found any of those holes, what they would do. It also has to do with documenting our network and making sure that all of our equipment's up to date, that we're up to date with patching and all of that type of stuff. So that's why um, this is being done, like I said, this year, because it was not a budgeted item. Um, in this year's budget, we're able to get the, and, I, and maybe in the future we might be able to get um, some funding for it as well, but we have added it to next year's budget um, to do this. So, Motion to approve the purchase of NIST Cybersecurity Framework Assessment and Cybersecurity Penetration Testing to Skyline Technology Solutions in the amount of $29,520. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right, thank you. And we will present you with the results that are found. We expect to have this done um, by the end of April, so we'll let you know Good. what cool. came up as part of this. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Chris, do you want to uh, go back to our public comment? Yes, sir. We have two public commenters waiting. Uh, we're going to call in uh, Miss Adelaide first. If she can hit star six to unmute, you may begin. You'll have three minutes. Please re-identify yourself, and thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Hello, commissioners. I heard that yawn. I know it's getting late. You need lunch, so I'm still going to use my three minutes. <laughs> just bear with me. Um, just wanted to update you quickly on my efforts to uphold the RNC platform, which is based on the Constitution. Like you, I'm balancing a bunch of other important uh, issues, um, like the March for Life on Monday, testified on two bills, SB 862, protecting women against coercive abuse and human trafficking, in favor of that to protect women from forced abortions, SB 0780, Maryland Online Child Protection Act, which provides a default filtering of obscene content on uh, manufacturing default on phones so our underage children aren't getting that junk put into their heads, which often makes them want to use drugs to uh, uh, compensate for the damage that that's done. Um, it is official Donald Trump is the GOP's presumptive presidential nominee as of Tuesday night. And as the Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero, that the removal of a federal candidate from a state ballot is not a state right, so the Supreme Court ruled in Gonzales v. Rake in 2005 held that the Commerce Clause includes the power to prohibit the local um, cultivation use of cannabis and supports the Controlled Substance Act of 1971 which Article 6 says is the supreme law. It trumps state law every time. I was thrilled to see a Kill County Times article that on Friday, or it came out Saturday, County May Nix weed sale, I like the use of the word weed, because that's what it is. I also noticed the use of the word sales, um, because it seems to be all about money. Uh, two times, the Kill County Times wrongly states that recreational cannabis is legal. Uh, this is what um, some would call a fake law. I would call it a legal fiction or disinformation. But I was thrilled to see um, the commission, um, the board, you know, step up on the plate, step up to the plate. And I like the use of the, you know, um, uh, Commissioner Kyler said if three of the five commissioners want to outlaw it in Carroll County, they have that right to do so. And Mr. Guerin also um, revealed rightly that the uh, local municipalities will also be at issue. But if you guys do the right thing and take care of it in Carroll County, I promise you that they will also be held accountable for following federal law in Carroll County because it will affect us all. Uh, finally, I guess um, I know you're concerned about the budget. It is a priority. Um, and the weed is connected to that because if the, if you can't, if the banks can't receive drug money, then how is Carroll County going to receive the proceeds from illegal drug money? Uh, the idea of allowing pot into Carroll County by breaking federal law to obtain revenues to help repair the damage caused by the pot 
borders on the scene. I mean, we're just going into crazy land here. We wouldn't need so many rehabs if we would start, if we would start, you know, telling the line on keeping it out. Um, Sunday is St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm asking for a joint um, issue statement from the sheriff's office because it is a, a holiday. Friday and Saturday will be heavier than usual, drinking and drugging, um, like you did for the 4th of July. Ask the citizens to not drink and drive high, whether from alcohol, pot, or any other drug, including prescription drugs. Um, there's non-alcoholic beer, and I personally enjoy sparkling cider. Um, so I hope they'll you know, continue to take care of the citizens of Carroll County. I appreciate everything you're doing, and again, um, Hot money is dirty money. The county doesn't need it. We have fewer rehabs and addicts if we keep some of these drugs out of our county. Thank you for all your hard work. I Thank you. Hands up. Thank you. Okay, we have one more caller online. If you could use star six to unmute and identify yourself, you'll have three minutes to make public comment this afternoon. Thank you. You may begin. Caller, you may have muted yourself on your phone. I can't, oops. We can hear you. How's that, how's that? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, hello, this is Sally Taylor. I live in Eldersburg, and I'm taking this opportunity to call to support the supermajority requirement for raising taxes and also endorse Commissioner Rothstein's addition to require a supermajority for expenses too, at least as he put it, for the very large capital purchases. The supermajority requirement to raise taxes has always been about limiting spending. It is the nature of government that it will spend all that has been given and want more and more. However, the supermajority does not prohibit raising county taxes. It means that a case for raising taxes has to be made and that at least four of you agree. As I listened to your March 7th conversation, you were all saying the same thing. You don't wanna raise taxes and you haven't made any cuts. So I would strongly urge that you take Commissioner Gordon's crazy idea, as he puts it, and dump it all into the budget and you guys sit there and bang out all the difficult issues. Look at the priorities and have the public conversation. Carroll Countyans understand the need for fiscal restraint. When we elected you, we expressed our confidence that you would make the hard decisions and not the easy one decision of funding everything and giving the taxpayers the bill. I appreciate the hard work that you guys are doing. I thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, that's the last caller? That is correct, sir. Okay. Commissioners, anybody have anything for open? Yeah, and I, I have a few things. Um, because it was brought up in Priority Carroll on a couple of uh, discussions we had last week. We have more opportunity to discuss it now this afternoon, and we should take that opportunity. First off, I appreciate um, Sally bringing that up, and you know, sometimes we may misspeak or things can get out of context. What I was, my intent was focusing on not necessarily the large capital projects because any dollar spent is a taxpayer's dollar. What I was referring to or was trying to get across was our primary role is to establish the budget by May 31st and then execute it throughout the year. If we determine a need to spend dollars that are out of the FY 24 budget right now and it becomes an out of cycle expense then that's what I was referring to we should take a look at how we're voting on doing that and honestly I don't care if it's a dollar or a million dollars um, but with that said I still believe it still should be a majority vote just like I believe the um, revenue should be a majority vote and I did make a mistake by going along with it, um, and I still believe that we can make that adjustment uh, appropriately, and we can have that conversation. Uh, but we need to, like I said, be able to put everything on the table, 
with equal, you know, uh, gravitas, with equal capabilities or equal uh, opportunities to then be able to take it off the table. I've been asking, requesting, begging you, my colleagues, along with the community to say, what do you want as we establish this budget? We say, we commit ourselves to uh, saying as soon as the budget's over, July or May 31st and we enact it, we'll get together and we'll start talking about the next year's budget. And well, we're at that you know, eve of the next year's budget discussions. And I am been saying the same things and still not getting any understanding of where uh, we all stand. But the more, and Ted has been saying this for years, that the more we provide him prior, the better off he is to establish a working budget walking in the door. So definitely I'm committed to our workforce uh, that we fund in their compensation that's embedded in the budget. It's, uh, I believe it's at 5.5%. So I'm absolutely 100% committed to that. Knowing that in the last 10 years or so, we've lost a workforce of about 100 and we're still doing all the services that we've been doing. So our workforce is, as you say, Commissioner Kyler, second to none. And we should ensure that they are compensated appropriately. We created a donut hole with our workforce years ago and we're not able to retain them, we got to a point where now we're able to retain them and if we do anything less than what we believe is appropriate, which is 5.5%, if not more, my concern is we'd be losing them. I'm absolutely committed to our uh, schools and our Board of Education's uh, collaboration with us and the school system. They put into our embedded operating budget already an above number than our maintenance of effort, but they're saying they need $10.8 million in addition. Now, whether we can get to $10.8 million is gonna be very difficult, but in having the conversations with the Board of Education, CCBS, we need to commit ourselves to above that maintenance of effort and in addition to the uh, ongoing budget, so even if it's a $5 million, which would then take the deficit that Commissioner Viglia, you say is 13, to $18 million. I'm absolutely 100% committed to maintaining our ag preservation program. I'm so proud of it. It's a goal of 100,000 acres. Honestly, I don't care if we codify 100,000 acres and we go to 105,000 or we go to 99,000, regardless, we do it better than anyone. And we need to, that's what we need to focus on. However, with that said, we commit ourselves with operational dollars currently at 2.5 million, I believe, uh, from the county. And I think we can do without that $2.5 million in operational funds, while still maintaining our ag preservation program and leveraging the uh, resources from the state. I am 100% committed not to using one-time funds that we've been doing in the past to mask the deficit. It's been shared that I've done it in the past and I have, and every time it's been done has been uh, a mistake and we need to stop masking the deficit that's in place. And this time, if we do it, it will be a very, very difficult hole to get ourselves out of. So in other words, you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And right now, I'm not sure where we're not digging because I don't understand what the priorities are I know what, the, what my priorities are. I know I wanna maintain our fire EMS commitment. I think we're gonna to have to curtail funding of that. It doesn't mean stop it, but I think it means that we're gonna to have to make some significant adjustments. I don't know what those dollars are. And you know, fortunately we have an awesome chief and staff that can get us 
to understanding what those dollars may be. So I can't commit to that. I'm 100% committed to our sheriff's department and our uh, state's attorney's, uh, you know, commitment to the community. We haven't even seen what their needs are yet, so that'll be interesting um, on what their needs are. Uh, you know, it's, I, I mean, that, that's gonna be a difficult one. Um, but again, I can't say I'm committed to a, a number because we just don't have it now. But, I, but the things I said, the workforce, our workforce compensation, our commitment to the Board of Education and CCPS as we've shared multiple times, our commitment to the ag preservation and how we can make adjustments while maintaining the commitment to ag preservation and leveraging the state our commitment to not using one-time funds. If we all say we can do this, or we say these are our priorities, then I think Mr. Zaleski can start with a different model in place. If not, we're gonna go right through the same drills we've been going through. And also, uh, this four to one vote, um, we do not have an even playing field. I am very much a fiscal conservative in everything I do. And I do not believe that, you know, having a 4-1 vote or a 5-0 or anything different makes you more or less of a fiscal conservative. I believe that we must maintain our revenue and build where necessary uh, without overbuilding and maintaining the culture we have in Carroll County. I believe in property owners' rights in developing where they believe it's appropriate and what they're allowed to develop. And we've been going through uh, that in many different times. So that's what this is about. And we're gonna go through work sessions and we're gonna sit around and talk about the same things. And I just don't know why we can't commit ourselves to saying these are our commitments uh, to at least give the management and budget team a little bit more than where they are right now. And I'm still not convinced, and Tim, you're gonna have to correct me if I'm wrong. If I am, that's fine. Can a four to one vote that's in place be voted on differently from the Board of County Commissioners? So in other words, a three to two vote to take away a four to one majority. Unfortunately, you don't have bylaws or, or anything else that govern it, so I have to go to Robert's Rules. And under Robert's Rules, uh, you have, there are five of you, and a majority of the five uh, can take any, take any vote. Uh, I'm gonna read. A plurality is the largest number of votes obtained in a situation where three or more choices are possible. Uh, a majority is always competent to adopt a motion unless the rules of order or the bylaws provide otherwise. So yes, you could take a vote of three to two to repeal one of the ordinances or, or the other ordinance as well. Unless you adopt a, a bylaw at, at the beginning of your term or something else that would govern such, such a situation. But as of now, those two uh, resolutions stand until they're, until they're repealed. And they could be repealed with a simple majority three to two yes. vote. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I said earlier, um, I probably said the four to one vote's a joke. I think it's it's politics. It's not good management, and uh, I, and ex commissioner Shoemaker knows uh, I felt that when he made that motion. Um, by law, we're required mm -hmm. to pass a balanced budget, and when we get to the end of the budget, um, if it's not balanced. We have to look at revenue, and that's why, to me, I don't care if that's hell. Make it 5-0. I don't give a crap. Um, we if we we have to propose a balanced budget, and uh, so we either need to do some serious cuts, or or we'll have to look at revenue. And uh, and I've always said I'm opposed to raising revenue, um, and and uh, but I look at. I look at where we've been the last several years, and except for COVID, 
money and extra money we got for that, we've been the skin on our teeth for revenues. I mean, we haven't raised taxes, and uh, um, I hope we can do another 20 years that we don't have to raise taxes, but this budget's going to be tough. Anybody else want to do open admin while we're here? I'm happy to share a couple thoughts to keep the conversation going if nobody's opposed to it. So I, uh, you know, it seems to me that the, the task that we have, and Commissioner Rossing had previously stated this quite well in talking about ensuring the greatest possible services uh, with limited resources that we have, although where we are now we're dealing with declining resources, particularly uh, knowing that we're going to have a $15 million shortfall in revenue for the current fiscal year, or that's what it seems like it's going to be. Um, you know, so th the question is really how do we get along as best we can with, with what we have? Um, you know, I, I have sent out a couple of emails and, and you know, we had these uh, preliminary uh, budget discussions prior to getting into the uh, budget season. Um, and I want to go over a couple of the things that I have suggested uh, over time, uh, not just for the sake of the record, but in the hopes of engendering uh, more discussion as we proceed. I agree with what Commissioner Kyler said. Uh, this morning that we will get the budget figured out. Um, and uh, as Commissioner Rossian has already begun the discussion, a huge part of that is having uh, the discussion. I think we, you know, we began that discussion in earnest last week, and I commend everybody here for doing that. You know, it's necessary to have uh, these discussions, and we knew that none of these discussions were going to be easy. We knew that these were not going to be uh, simple conversations, and, and we certainly knew that uh, some of them uh, would be more uh, passionate than others. But um, uh, anyway, so uh, one of the things that I, I had asked about, and one of the things that we had talked about um, in our uh, previous discussions, the uh, capital projects that we have ahead of us, how many of these are absolutely necessary to do in the current year? How many of them can we delay? How many of them we can we put off um, in, in the hope of freeing up some kind of, of money there? Um, I agree as well with Commissioner Rossi, and I think a few others up here have also said at various points we should not be using, uh, again, what dwindling one-time revenue we have to try to uh, uh, scrape by, because eventually that money will run out. And as I had said earlier during this meeting, uh, during the discussion on the potential for altering uh, transit for the county, uh, you know, we're going to be no good to anybody if we don't have any money to provide for any of the services whatsoever. So that, that's certainly a, a discussion that, that we do need to have. Um, you know, the, the commentary about uh, AgPres, I'm totally in favor of continuing the AgPres program. Uh, one of the uh, thoughts that I had had maybe was, you know, if, if instead of using the non-recurring revenue to plug the gap every year, if we use some of that to forward fund AgPres to free up some recurring revenue for the budget as it is ongoing. Uh, you know, we had discussions about whether or not we need to reorganize, or, reorganize or, or reconsider how we're implementing the Department of Fire and Emergency Services. It's not like we, you know, can do without uh, EMS, for example. Uh, but the question is, is uh, you know, are we uh, proceeding down a path where we are again delivering the best possible service for uh, what we are doing? Uh, you know, the, the school board uh, requested an additional 10.8 million dollars from us. And, uh, you know, the Board of Ed, the superintendent, uh, the, the uh, administration over at CCPS uh, were very diligent and, and very uh, uh, gracious in providing us a very detailed budget. It's something that not every Board of Education in every other county does, uh, but it certainly uh, prevails upon us to look through that to see what it is that they're, you know, specifically looking for with that $10.8 million. Uh, you know, to, to agree to give them all, and I, I don't mind saying this, to agree to give them the entire $10.8 million on top of the $13.1 million deficit that we're beginning FY25 with. I, you know, I have no idea how on earth, how on earth we do that. Um, and we are already allocating an additional $6 million for them as it currently stands in the budget that we're, we're considering for FY25. Um, you know, one of the uh, difficulties that we will have, and this is something else that I brought up and also put in one of my emails, trying to distinguish uh, costs that increase due to blueprint and regular uh, costs that increase for the uh, school system because we are going to be contending with, with requirements from blueprint. Uh, you know, knowing that there is, a, I forget whether it's 45-55 or 55-45, the split for the, the funding that we provide for the Board of Ed versus what the state 
provides. I know one of the, the questions I get a lot is, well, can you just say no to Blueprint? Can you just say, well, we're not going to do it? But if the, the state is threatening to cut 25 percent of, of uh, education funding as it is, uh, to attempt to uh, make up for that loss, I'm not sure that we have the financial capability to make up for what the state would take away from us if we did not uh, at least try to implement certain parts of Blueprint. Another thing that I have uh, you know, repeatedly said uh, is that we're never going to be able to fully implement Blueprint, and so I don't think we should try to overextend ourselves attempting to do something that we're never going to be able to do to begin with. So are there limited ways that we can uh, attempt to uh, comply uh, with what is being mandated uh, for us from the state versus attempting to, to go the entire mile, so to speak? Um, you know, again, uh, we had had the discussion a little earlier today about whether or not we consider privatizing uh, transportation uh, when we heard uh, transit. When we heard uh, back a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, whatever it was, we're on uh, uh, track for over 100,000 uh, 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 trips uh, for the current fiscal year, and we also know we're going to be having reduced grant funding from the state and from the federal government. And so again, is this with over 100,000 trips a year? Is this something that would be better handled by? private sector, by, by the market economy. Um, and one of the questions that I, I would like to, to plunge into, uh, outside of Department of Fire and Emergency uh, Services and a few other departments, what, what, what are we doing now that we were not doing 20 or 30 years ago? You know, how did we get by 20 or 30 years ago without certain services that we are providing now? Um, one of the things that I've, re I've also talked about over time is that you know we've been very uh, intense on growing relationships with our municipalities. You know I think we're all scheduled to attend uh, tonight's Maryland uh, Municipal League uh, quarterly chapter dinner here in Westminster, and uh, you know one of the things that we look at when we are dealing with zoning is we're trying to grow our our tax base, right? If we're talking about having to increase uh, tax revenue. Uh, you know, we, we as conservatives all the time talk about how, you know, well, we don't want to raise taxes, but we have to grow the tax base itself. And so the available commercial and industrial land that we have in the county to grow the base, to grow the, that base, uh, you know, is, is limited. And so do we find ways to partner with our municipalities, some of them who want to change the, the zoning of certain parts of their, their uh, uh, jurisdictions? to uh, encompass industrial or commercial expansion. So that, that's a way that, that everybody could end up benefiting uh, from that. Um, you know, another question that, that you guys all know that I routinely ask, you know, where are we with the PFAS lawsuits, right? I mean, I know we certainly have, um, you know, we're going to have obligations for PFAS remediation over time. Uh, and I know we are trying to set aside some funding for that every year. Uh, you know, understanding that we are going to have a serious uh, cleanup ahead of us. But again, we don't quite know what financial uh, uh, receipt we're going to get from those lawsuits. I mean, I know one of the companies has already settled, and I think there's one or there's a couple more companies that are still outstanding. And that's certainly going to affect our uh, financial picture as well. Now, I, I certainly take the point uh, that Commissioners Kyler and Rothstein have made about having an exquisite workforce. We definitely do have an exquisite workforce. But, you know, the, the idea that uh, we're going to be giving a 5.5 percent raise, is this something that we also need to consider? Because this, you know, it isn't just a 5.5 percent raise for the current year. It's a raise every single year. And, and you know, please don't misunderstand me here. You know, I, I want people to be fairly compensated and justly compensated for the work that they do. And I understand that the employees for our county, uh, you know, the, the, the rate of pay that we have across the board is far less than, than neighboring counties. But again, you know, harking back to, to what we talk about with Blueprint and how we're, even if we tried and, and raised every single tax we could and did everything we could, we are never going to be able to fully satisfy Blueprint. And so, with respect to uh, uh, the, the salaries that we offer here, uh, you know, what other benefits, what other things are, are admissible or, or possible to attempt to compensate? And because again, we can raise salaries, but we're still never going to be able to outcompete other counties. And we may raise ours 5% this year, another county raises theirs 5%, and we're still trailing behind these other counties. 
And the argument that I always used uh, when I was on the city council in Tawnytown is we have to strive to be competitive. We're never going to be able to out-compete anybody, but if we can at least be competitive with the, what we offer our, uh, our, our workers, then you know, we certainly have to take those, that, that into consideration. Um, some of the other things that I had uh, mentioned in previous uh, meetings. Uh, you know, there are a number of potential cuts that, that we had talked about early on. Um, you know, adult basic education, for example, has a minimum, uh, minimum of $204,000 that we're required to fund it, and currently we're funding it at $284,000, so that's $80,000 that we could remove. Uh, the entrepreneurship program is $120,000, is totally uh, discretionary. Um, you know, uh, the, the, again, going back to PFAS remediation, right, last year we took two of uh, the $3 million allocated for this year. Um, and, and, you know, again, is it something else that we cut funding for in the coming year? You know, we're, we're um, going through uh, the expand, but we're looking at different parks. We have a number of different parks that are under uh, consideration for development. And one of the questions that we did ask was, you know, what we have to prior to prioritize park development, right? It's one thing to have the land, but to, 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 you know, try to run full steam to develop all of them at the same time is not feasible. And I know that our a very capable parks and, or rec and parks director has already given us a recommendation for how to go about prioritizing uh, park development. Another uh, thought I had had at some point was the Carroll County Sports Complex. Is that something that we privatize or enter into a private-public partnership? Um, you know, so it, it there are, I, I don't want to go on too much farther here, further here because I know that these are discussions better suited for being in budget workshops, but, you know, I want, again, wanted to go on record uh, and in, indeed to uh, continue on with what Commission Rossine is, is doing here very well is engendering conversation about where we go and in what we do. You know, like Commissioner Rothstein, I, I certainly, uh, you know, understand that we haven't even received requests yet from the sheriff's department or from the state's attorney, from the clerk, from the courts. And, you know, is it a law and order county? These are certainly, for me, priorities as well. Um, and again, I, I hope I haven't gone on far too long here, but again, I thought it was important to, to go through all of these things, again, not least of which for the public record, but to engender discussion about where we are and, and the things we face. And again, the, the last thing, I, w I will say one more thing, and I apologize for this. I did say this last week, and this is also incredibly important to remember. Uh, last year, during our budget discussions, we you know, were told by a number of people that we need to live within our means. And while I take the point that our, our uh, sp uh, expenditures have risen over years, um, you know, a lot of this, again, is not of our choosing. We find ourselves in a situation that we have the responsibility to make right. And that's why, again, I applaud us for having these discussions because this is the job that we were elected to do. And I think it is absolutely necessary that we have these discussions because, you know, th th this, again, there are a lot of um, misconceptions about where we are right now. Again, I, I'll, the last point I'll bring up, you know, we, we have taken pains over the last year and a half to, to, to reform government. Again, I brought up the example last week of combining departments to improve uh, uh, efficiencies, to improve services to our citizens. Um, you know, we've all been very cognizant of that. And, and again, knowing that some of these discussions will certainly get heated, I just want to lay some groundwork there that, that, you know, it's not like one of us has proposed, oh, let's, let's create a brand new uh, department, and I'm going to make something up here. We've created a brand new department to, to you know, deal with arborism, to trees, right? Uh, that, that is going to cost us $50 million a year. None of us have come into this position uh, with any kind of spending or, or planning or, or crazy giant expenditures that we wanted to accomplish. You know, we are all conservatives, and we understand that, that you know, sometimes the best service that we can provide is to make sure that, that simple services are carried out. You know, I, but since the progressive era, we're under this, this kind of mindset. Uh, and this has never really gone away that to be an effective leader, we have to have some kind of, of massive policy prescription or fundamentally transforming uh, legislative uh, 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 act that would uh, justify our holding these seats. But, but I would contend, and I'm sure probably everybody here uh, would agree, that when basic services are provided, when the sheriff is able to respond to calls, when trash is taken out, uh, when uh, the roads are plowed in the winter, when people come into the county for, for services of, of any kind, 
and we're able to provide all of those basic services to our citizens, we're doing our job. We're doing our job. And, and again, we don't need to, to have some kind of, of you know, self-aggrandizing, massive spending program to our, our names, to our credit. Having a, a basic functioning government that provides high quality caliber services for our citizens is, is you know, and, and again, in my mind, the, the, the function that we're attempting to carry out here. And, and I, again, I, I, I am done now. I apologize for going on at length, but I did want to help engender the, uh, the discussion that is, that is underway. We, we did establish a sheriff's department. That's something significant that was done. Um, you said, what, you know, we went from three commissioners to five commissioners. We did lower taxes three cents a dozen years ago. It was the last time taxes were adjusted in the county. We also reduced our workforce by around 100 folks while maintaining the services that we do. That's why I'm so committed in the workforce. And again, having workforces of around 1,000 folks, I know what it means. And uh, so putting that in place, um, I believe we should not waver on that compensation for a workforce that's already you know, tied the knot at the end of the rope and trying to hang on, being competitive. It's, it's, it's amazing uh, what they do. So, um, yeah, lessening anything lower than that 5.5, I think, is cruel. And we would impact our county significantly over the next few years. So, but there, those are some of the changes that have taken place. Um, and, you know, establishing the uh, fire EMS, you know, in, in its nascency. We're still there, but we're, we're getting there, um, let alone blueprint, but yes, so, okay. Okay. Um, agenda. Uh, I, actually, I, I wasn't sure if uh, Commissioner Say Gordon again. had any. I wasn't sure oh, if Commissioner good. Gordon had oh, any. Oh, okay, all right then. So well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I looked and, and asked ahead. two or three times. We yeah. can talk till 3 o'clock. Okay, all right. I just wanted to say something, too. I just hope right. everybody's as vocal when we do budgets. Okay, well, speaking of budget, um, we did get together after the last budget session, and we did meet, and unfortunately it just didn't, it wasn't very fruitful, but we tried. Um, as far as the resolution goes, uh, the four to one, I, I, I honestly don't understand how it could be three to two, but I'd like, you know, the legal opinion on that. It's a resolution, it's not an ordinance. So if that's the case, I'd, I'd like to know um, how that's really going to play out. Uh, there was a comment made about, you know, establishing priorities and things like that. And, and if you sent out an email, I appreciate it. And if you expected a response, you shouldn't because. Those discussions belong out in the open, and we have to uh, Open Meetings Act. We have to be careful we don't violate. So uh, I'm not really sure that's where we should be doing things. In fact, I know that's not where we should be doing things. Um, I commend uh, Commissioner Vigliotti for having the courage to actually talk about some of these things that might, might make it through the budget process. Um, next Tuesday, we will sit for the recommended budget, um, but um, you know, so I appreciate everybody's thoughts. Um, in good faith, uh, I want to make this budget cycle straightforward and efficient. I feel like last year's really wasn't, and most of us were new. So I, I hope we can make some improvements in that realm. And if we if we're at a stand if we're at a stalemate, you know, we take a break or something, or we just stop for the day. I don't know. We, we we've got to figure out a way to kind of make progress. The uh, but. If we want to ensure ourselves in a sound fiscal trajectory, and that's important because we do things five years out, we have to avoid making the mistakes of past boards. I do feel that they require bold action, as evidenced by last year. Again, I don't think if we sit and try to do things sort of in-depth surgically, it just doesn't seem to work out real well in the past. I think a line-by-line -line of review seems like a good idea, but it's not very fruitful. Um, we are going to take, like I said, we are going to have to take bold action. I think what amounts to really a reset is needed if we want to live within our means. Uh, that's going to include modest additional growth to the Carroll County public school budget. 
we, we have already got six million in there. They've asked for almost 11 million at a time when other school districts are cutting their budget, which I'm not really sure I understand how some of these school systems have run out of money because they, they certainly have a lot of revenue. Certain departments and services may have to be funded at their FY24 levels and budget accordingly. FY24 levels, yes, I said it. Uh, certain nonprofits may have to do the same thing. You might have to look at having your budgets funded at FY24 levels and budget accordingly. The proposed amount of 5.5% for um, employee raises, I think, is unreasonable. We need to look at the scope and pace of our stormwater management projects in the county because they're very expensive. And I know oftentimes when we sit there and argue that we need to slow things down, the response is, well, you still got to pay for them. And that's true, but we need a little bit of a breather here. Like I said, I think we need to reset. And as mentioned by Commissioner Vigliotti, we, we should remove or postpone, we should really look at some of these CIP projects. We are going to have to delay or remove some of these if going forward. And again, I understand that they still may have to be paid for in the past, but we need a breather. We need some breathing room if we're going to do things differently than the past umpteen boards. Uh, and if departments are finding themselves in need of significant amount of money, well, then they can come to us and ask for it. Uh, if, it's just, if it's already in the budget, again, they're gonna, they may have to take some tough choices as well. Um, if we, uh, in terms of priorities, I think, I think we know what the citizens of the county feel are their priorities. I think as commissioners, we have a tougher decision because we have to take a look across the board, but public safety and fire and EMS is certainly a priority. Managing growth in the county, whether that means increasing commercial, industrial, what we do with residential, I think that is an important part of what we need to do as priority. Department of Public Works, people expect good roads. We do have to maintain that. We do have to seriously, that, that's, that for me is a priority, and as well as schools, of course. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm not unique, but I, I have kids in the school system. Last thing I want to see is our good school system do fail. That's not going to happen. We're not going to let that happen. But um, so those are priorities for commissioners. I think for the citizens of the county, Honestly, it's even simpler. It's, they don't want to be priced out of Carroll County either. It's tough times. The economy stinks. Inflation's actually going up. Property tax assessments are going up. I hear from people every day. So they don't want to make things more difficult. They don't want to make things more expensive. They don't want their taxes to go up. They do are concerned greatly with growth. It's something I think all of us are cognizant of, but they don't want to see the county, Carroll County become the next Montgomery County or Howard County or Frederick County. They do care about crime. I, I know I, it sounds a little odd because crime is m relatively low in the, uh, the county, but I think people in the county are very cognizant of what goes on around us. So I do think crime is actually a major concern because they don't want to see that happen here. Unfortunately, we've got a, a Class A, uh, a Sheriff's Department to, to keep an eye on that. And then again, schools as well. Um, schools, not because they have kids in them, because that's always transitory, but property owners and people who live here know, are smart enough to realize that good schools means higher property values and things like that. So I join, I join my colleague, Commissioner Vigliotti, in, in actually talking about what some of these, com some of these cuts we might have, not, not, some of these decisions we may have to make. Um, if you're, if you're uh, again, we've got a tough, issue ahead of us and if I think it's just going to take bold action and, and, and a reset if you will maybe exactly what's needed so we can get ourselves on a better track going forward um, because we do try to look five years out so you know I'm just happy to throw my two cents in as well and we'll see what happens starting next week. Mr. Garden. Well I think we all can agree what the base priorities are we've said fire EMS sheriff state's attorneys and schools and as we all know, there's a ton of things that everybody wants. The challenge is we can't fund them all. We really have been 
put in some interesting places over the years. And to Commissioner Guerin's point, I think we need to take a hard look, and I know there's been some conversation, I'm not gonna get into it this morning publicly, but we need to have conversation about how we maintain some of the properties we own as county government and how we utilize those, because it's the taxpayer's property. So are there opportunities there that we're not currently utilizing to its fullest extent? And I'm not saying that's gonna solve the budget, because it's not. It's not gonna. But it, it, yeah, exactly. But to you know, Commissioner Vigliotti's point, we, both, we, we all discussed this in our one budget meeting, the idea of looking at sponsorship levels for rec and parks. Now, is that gonna solve anything? Not on the major level, but it's still more money coming in than what's coming in now. So the reality to me is we have to take a hard look at this collaboratively and collectively as a team, all five of us. Do I think we're gonna all agree constantly? Absolutely not. Um, to Commissioner uh, Rothstein's point, I understand where he's coming from with the question of people bringing in things for uh, discussion of uh, that's not in budget. I think that's a great point. I think that's something we need to have a hard look at. Um, and also I think things that come in the door just because it's within budget, should we be approving all these things? Uh, it's sort of like the grant this morning that kind of came in front of us that. Yeah, let me interrupt. We approved the budget. We approved spending that money. If, if if we don't have any foresight, then yeah, I guess we need to look at how we vote on st stuff in the budget. We approve the budget. That's what we need to do now. If we don't want that, take it out of the budget. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that there are times where I think some things come in and it's, it's almost, I hate to use the word routine. It's sort of like having a grant and I'm not criticizing anybody or that process. But literally, we have eight days till that grant has to be filed. And I know we all have a lot going on, but that's no window. And if there was a, pro if there was a real concern there that we had to make that happen right now, we're stuck. Yes. It's either a yes or a no. That, that's my point. Yeah, I agree. So I agree. to me, yep. we need to be you know, trying to you know, utilize our staff to the best of, our, of their abilities and see if we can find some opportunity there to, to you know, reorganize some of that. And we do have a great staff. I'm never going to argue that or debate that with anybody because we all know that. I mean, anyone that comes into this building or any other county property knows we have a great staff that works hard, they're dedicated people, and there's no debate about that. We all will agree on that. I'll actually put that out there. So to me, what we need to do is really take a hard look at this budget. And yes, we've had some conversations, but I think there needs to be quite a bit more. And to Commissioner Guerin's point, yes, I think if, you know, Last year was the first year for four of us. Commissioner Rothstein was here prior. Yeah. But I think the reality is if we, if we get caught for a minute, let's take 10 minutes. Let's regroup and come back. I mean, I'm not saying that's going to solve the world's problems, but we need to really dig deep on this. And I think we're all committed to that. How we may get there is, is uh, different opinions based upon that. So that's my thoughts for today. Yeah. And I agree. And then again, I, I said it about last week. These are important discussions, and uh, and thank you guys. It's uh, it's it's we we got to talk about it. But but we I think we need to learn a couple lessons from last year. One, projects capital budget has very little to do with the operating budget. It might save interest on a bond. Um, and then what I hear from a lot of people outside of here you could change this uh, let, and I know we can't let's say you can get rid of your county attorney you don't need him that, that's a little speck on the budget you know it's uh, it's 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 not the answer and and we really really it unfortunately and you guys said it safety schools roads they're the services we want to provide and they're the big money stuff and and uh, letting somebody rent a sports field for a day ain't going to pay for any of that now you're right we need to look at everything every you know the old uh you know watch the pennies and the dollars fall in line it, it's it's hard but uh times it's going to take a lot of time through this budget process to really analyze that deep and and uh, i'm up for it it's it's going to be interesting are you ready for us yet <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your patience with us, Wanda. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> oh, my. Now the agenda. Oh, that's I, you. 
I didn't say we were getting rid of you. I'm sorry. That's, yeah, who said that? I, by that the was way. hypothetical. Wow. I didn't hear that, Mr. Burke. Nobody told me to get rid of you. <laughs> oh, okay. Monday, March 18th, no no activities. Tuesday, uh, 9 a.m. Open session. Recommended budget presentation. Um, 2 p.m. Veterans Advisory Meeting. Commissioner Gordon and Kyler. Um, 5.30, the uh, AG's annual dinner meeting, Commissioners Gordon, Kyler, and Rothstein. And I did tell them I'm probably an hour late, but I'm coming. Um, Wednesday, uh, there, is, there is a MACO legislative meeting live in Annapolis, correct? Yeah, actually it starts at 9, I have a MACO board meeting at 9.30 down in Annapolis, and then the legislative committee meeting so okay <clears throat> yeah and then uh, Mako luncheon right outstanding teachers award 6 p.m. Uh, Commissioner Gordon um, 7 p.m. ESAC Commissioner Garen on Thursday um, 8 a.m. closed admin 9 a.m. Um, so I'm sorry Commissioner's open, uh, Priority Carroll uh, on a, a retirement. Um, item one, discretionary grant application for circuit court. Item two, legislative update. Item three, uh, phase two roof replacement. Item four, uh, restoration coating and flashing uh, purchase approval. Item five, uh, comment letter for Hampstead annexation. Item six, comment letter for Westminster annexation. Item seven, uh, exercise on option to purchase um, through Critical Farms program. 1 p.m. open session, uh, position committee presentation, public comment. Now, the the one p.m. is that is that timing, or there's actually a break between the two meetings? There's a break between the two meetings. Okay. And uh, and that item is supposed to take ninety minutes, so it's a it's it'll be one to two thirty. Um, public comment, agenda review. Um, Friday, no activities. Saturday, uh, March twenty third. Annual Read Across the American event, Commissioner Gordon. Sunday, uh, the podcast is Commissioner Gordon, and there's an Eagle Scout Court of Honor um, at the VFW. For Thursday's meetings, I will be virtual for the 8 a.m. and the 9 a.m. and the 1 p.m. I'll have to watch it later. Um, I'll be out of town. Um, second week, Monday, March 25th, no activities. Tuesday, March 26th, uh, open session, agency budget hearings. Wednesday, uh, Carroll Community College trustees, Commissioner Kyler. Thursday, 9 a.m. is the Sheriff's Office graduation ceremony in Hampstead. And all five of us are going there, and then that, that'll change the typical open meeting to 11 a.m. And I guess we'll need to decide if we feel like open admins needed and try to work it in. Otherwise, it, there won't be any schedule. So with the, with the agency, budget hearings that we're going to be doing. Uh, I noticed there are just blocks of time set aside for them, but no set schedule for them yet, or how long each, uh, each participant is going to be allotted. Is that up to us to decide, or is that something that's being worked out? Or That is something that's being worked out by the budget office. They're working with the agencies on the issues, how much time they need, and okay. specifically what it is they're bringing before the board. So we can provide that to you yeah. prior to you know, at the beginning of the week or even the prior week. Yeah, just, just some sort of sense of how long it might last would be. Yes. 
Okay. So they're yeah, they're still working through okay. all their agencies okay. and, and the time and slots. Right. And I'm sure we probably already are, but I definitely want to talk about time limits for each participant because I don't yeah, want that too. you know, have a respect for others. I don't want somebody to go on for like three hours and then somebody gets ten minutes at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. And and probably next week when you, we do the agenda review, we'll know better on yes. the, the time for that following week. We will. Mm -hmm. Okay, 11 a.m., uh, Commissioner's Open Session, number one, legislative update, number two, uh, approval maintenance contract, number three, uh, grant approval to submit application and accept award Wakefield Valley restoration design, item four, approval submit application accept awards george's murphy run restoration opportunities um, public comment agenda review uh, 1 p.m open session for agency budget hearings and 6 30 is Funksburg planning and citizens council i think i think their guest is the sheriff and I, i'm going at 6 30. And uh, Friday and Saturday show open, and uh, Sunday is uh, Commissioner Guerin's podcast for that that week. Yeah, you got Easter. I do. I better maybe I'll pre-tape. All those of you who can't wait to hear me talk on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> I intend to uh, I intend to do my prayers and celebrate Easter, and then I'll come home yes, and uh, listen Easter. to your podcast. Oh, all right. Okay. I'm gonna take you up on that. I'm gonna okay, ask yeah. you what I said. <laughs> Um, does anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Oh, I just need you to sign this transportation letter. They did make the change. They printed out the new letter. And I have another signature folder. I assume it's just me. Yeah, I don't think I need anybody else's signatures. Um, now do we want to make a motion to adjourn? <clears throat> so moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those that want to stay longer? <laughs> no. Quiet. Thank you. <laughs>